call to order the regular meeting of the Board of Directors of the Golden Rain Foundation of Laguna Woods, California Nonprofit Mutual Benefit Corporation. Today is Tuesday, October 1st. Can you believe it? October already. And it's 9.30. We're in the boardroom of the community center. Uh, <clears throat> we do have a quorum. We have what's left of our board here. <laughs> And uh, we'll start with the uh, Pledge of Allegiance, and would you lead us, please, Director Bada? Good morning, everybody. Please stand. Repeat with me. I pledge, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. All right. I don't think we have any other media except we are. Do we have anybody on Zoom? Not yet. Okay. Nobody on Zoom, but we are also on Granicus. Uh, <clears throat> I now ask for approval of our agenda. Can I have a motion? Joan? Martin, are there any objections? Okay, the agenda is approved without objection. Now, in the minutes that we have, we have kind of two different things here. The first five are all uh, minutes of our various budget workshops, uh, starting in March and going through August. Uh, and so I'd like to take those as one uh, item. Can I have a motion to approve those, Donna? Second, Kush, okay. Question. Yes. Uh, is that uh, the workshops, that's the finance committee that met with? No, the, it's not the finance committee. It's the various workshops that we had for the full board. The budget workshops. Budget workshops. Okay, okay. <laughs> my apologies, thank you. <laughs> okay. All right, are there any objections to approving the minutes of the budget workshops? Seeing none, they are approved without objection. Uh, and now we'll look at F and G. The first is from our regular board meeting last month. Uh, and the second is from our agenda prep meeting uh, for this meeting. So uh, are there any objections to the uh, meeting minutes for September? Okay, without objection, they're all approved as presented. <clears throat> Report of the chair. As you see, we're a little shy this morning, <laughs> but this is almost our full board. William is in Korea for the whole month at a big convention for his Labor Relations Board. Uh, so we are struggling along. Donna is going to fill in for him while he's gone. And <clears throat> uh, one sad note I would like to take just a minute to recognize uh, a longtime, very valuable employee, Tony Barr, who passed away last week. Uh, he was in security for a number of years and then really shown at our concierge desk out in the lobby uh, when he moved over to resident services. He will be deeply missed by many of us. The other thing I want to mention is we have a number of things coming up. I will get into uh, uh, one of them a little bit later, but I also wanted to remind, remind everybody that our annual meeting is November 13th. And we will be having the election on that day for our new board members. So it's a combination of GRF meeting and corporate members. The corporate members vote for the new directors for GRF. So it's kind of a combined meeting, and it's our annual meeting always. Okay, I have other, but I'm going to talk about those later. So let's go on to the next thing, which uh, is our open forum. CEO. Do we? CEO. A CEO report. I can't skip over that. Sorry. Had it written over. <laughs> Got a good one here. Honorable Vice President, <clears throat> members of the board, audience, it's my pleasure this morning to present the CEO report. 
This morning I'd like to introduce the VMS benchmarking report. This has been highlighted in the recent editions of What's Up in the Village. The VMS Board of Directors guided VMS executive leadership through benchmarking, which compares an organization with others in the same industry or the broader marketplace. Benchmarking helps companies improve processes, technologies, reduce costs, enhance customer satisfaction, and much more. The report findings aim to guide VMS in improving performance, practices, and strategic planning, and provide members with a greater understanding of VMS services and how its costs compare to similar organizations. The report compares services and costs of VMS's nine departments with services provided by for-profit companies, government entities, and age-restricted sister communities, such as Leisure World, Seal Beach, and Rossmore Walnut Creek. VMS staff research included budget and website reviews, interviews, quotes, service levels, requests for proposals, and labor costs. This morning, I would like to point you to the Village website, or you can visit Bitly VMS Benchmark to review and or download the complete report. It's also on Laguna Woods Village Documents VMS. Further details will be provided in editions of What's Up in the Village and The Village Breeze. Today I would like to share specifics from one of the nine areas of study, which is general administration. General administration was benchmarked against sister communities and smaller cities in Orange County. This category includes the functions of administration, communications, corporate secretary, and human resources. Benchmarking criteria includes costs and operational metrics. In terms of operational metrics, each function was evaluated in terms of complexity, complex, moderate, and low. Administration is based on the magnitude of services managed. Communications looked at methods and quantity of communications outreach. Corporate secretary is based on the number of meetings administered per year. And human resources is based on the ratio of human resource employees to staff. The results show that VMS provides cost-competitive general administration with robust service levels. General government functions comprise about 7.5% of the total GRF budget, which is 2.4% less than Rossmore Walnut Creek and 9% less than Leisure World Seal Beach. VMS offers higher service levels at lower costs and leader staffing levels than these sister communities. And VMS generally offers higher service levels than the city surveyed at comparable costs and leaner staffing levels. This table shows the results in graphic form. You will see the percentage of budget and then the percentage of employees allocated to general administration and then to the right the complexity of administration, communications, corporate secretary, and HR complexity. And again, all of our areas are in the complex range and yet we provide them at a lower cost of service than our comparisons. In terms of what we have learned for general administration, while VMS seems to make better use of technology than its sister communities, comparisons with municipalities indicate VMS may make greater use of technology for boards and committee meetings and employee recruitment and selection and other human resource functions. VMS will continue to explore best practices that may lead to operational efficiencies and cost savings. Switching gears, I would like to provide an update on bicycle theft in our community. We have experienced an uptick in bicycle and electronic bike thefts, which mirrors activity also outside our community. Security has been working very closely with the Orange County Sheriff's Department. A dedicated investigator was assigned earlier this summer, and Orange County Sheriff's Department conducts extra patrols with marked and unmarked vehicles. Trail cameras have also been placed in locations where suspects may be entering the property. The good news is that diligent observation by security personnel led to an arrest on August 18th. The Sheriff's Department came to the scene and confirmed the bike in possession was stolen. The subject admitted to entering village property with a friend to steal bikes. The suspect was arrested for possession of stolen property, among other charges. Since that arrest, there have only been two thefts in the community, which indicates we believe the main suspects have been caught. The Orange County Sheriff's Department and security recommends the community use the following bike prevention tips. 
Hide it, lock it, or lose it. Stow your bike safely out of view. Do not make your bicycle a temptation to others. Choose the right place to lock your bicycle. Inside the home or a courtyard is safest. Choose the best lock. Protect bike parts. If a special accessory is not riveted to the bicycle, chances are someone will try to steal it. Keep records of your make, model, color, and serial number of your bicycle and take photographs. We also encourage residents to register their bike through the Resident Bicycle Registration Program. The next event is Friday, October 18th at Clubhouse 5 from 10 a.m. to noon. Security services staff will take a photo of your bike and its serial number and add the information to the department's database. You can also do this online by visiting lagunawoodsvillage.com residents security services to register your bike online or via mail. And please remember to contact security pers personnel if you see anything suspicious or unknown persons in the community. If you see something, please say something. And in conclusion, I want to remind you of the following disaster preparedness events. On Tuesday, October 8th, is the Department of Security Services and Disaster Preparedness Task Force event. They are co-hosting Quake Heroes in Clubhouse 5. This, in, at this expo, you may ride an earthquake simulator, watch an inspiring film based on true stories. This starts at 10.15 a.m. Get discounts on earthquake preparedness supplies and much more. On Thursday, October 17th at 10.17 a.m. is the annual statewide Great Shakeout Earthquake Drill. And you can use this opportunity to prepare for disaster by identifying your drop cover and hold locations, inventorying personal emergency supplies, and updating your emergency contact information with family and friends. And that concludes my update this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Are there any questions for Siobhan on her report? Seeing none, we will go on to the <coughs> now open forum. Michaela, do we have anybody for open forum this morning? Yes, we have um, a few in-person speakers and then one um, speaker via Zoom. So the first speaker. <clears throat> the first speaker will be Chris Collins. Good morning, Chris Collins, 3306Q. Um, I'm here with an update on the work of the Foundation of Luguna Woods Village, which we do on behalf of uh, residents who are experiencing temporary financial crisis. Meet your good neighbor, the Florence Sylvester Senior Center. On September 28th this year, National Good Neighbor Day gave us the chance to recognize and appreciate the important role of neighbors. Being a good neighbor can't help build, can help build strong relationships, prevent social isolation, enrich our cultural experiences, and ensure help in emergencies. Getting to know your neighbors is the first step in building stronger neighbor relations. A new, a new Foundation of Laguna Woods Village initiative with AgeWell is intended to introduce a good neighbor near the village, and that's the Florence Sylvester Senior Center. Beginning on September 9th, as part of a program called Nutrition Connections to encourage visit village residents to learn about and participate at the Village Sylvester Senior Center, any resident taking a village bus to the center can get free lunch for a month funded by the Foundation of Laguna Woods Village. There are two requirements for village residents. First of all, you must arrive um, on a village bus and they must call to make a reservation First, which is at 949-380-0155, extension 15. Through this new initiative, residents can enjoy a nutritious lunch while socializing with other residents. This is an opportunity to meet the village's good neighbor, which is the, senior, the Florence Sylvester Senior Center, and then you can participate in many programs there, while also learning how to use the village bus transportation. At the Senior Center, you might want to play bingo, enjoy a game of cribbage, knit or crochet, participate in chair yoga, or get iPhone technical assistance, among other activities. So for, your inf for information about the foundation, please go to our website, which is the foundation of lagunawoodsvillage.org. And um, you can um, also 
contact us on um, by email, which is the foundation on comline.com about this Good Neighbor Initiative. Thank you. Thank you, Chris, and as always, thanks to the foundation. They do such great work here in the in the village. <coughs> next, uh, next speaker is Ellen Leonard. Good morning. Good morning. Um, uh, I brought this up once before, and I'm going to bring it up as a point of. Um, reference so that maybe somebody could get me some explanation as to the exceptions to the trust facility fee. I received some legal information, jargon, that I asked for something to be simplified so it would be easier to understand, and I'd appreciate it. Any feedback that I could get? Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, let's see. Next speaker is <clears throat> Sharon uh, Peavy. And then if I could get Pat Arnold over here for just a second. Thank you. But Sharon Peavy is next. Hello. I'm Sharon Peavy. I'm the president of the California Club here. And um, I'm talking very quickly about two um, events or two bits of information about the Performing Arts Center. And I know you're going to be discussing in private meeting about the uh, renovation of the sound system. As a club that requires doing at least four packs a year to help fund our dinner dances, we in fact only charge the members 70% of the actual costs of our dinner dances, and the balance of those funds are uh, received to us from the pack shows. There have been a lot of problems with the sound, and they say over 20 events have had to be stopped and held up and fixed in the middle of the event. And I know our last one, we had a few minute delay at the beginning because of the problems of the analog and the dig digital not connecting. Um, I really hope you can get that approved because it is so necessary for the clubs that are using the PAC to keep our membership prices low for our events. And in that regards, we've been told that there are several new clubs that have been formed specifically to do music and music for the PAC. Um, our club, and Louis Billowitz said that he would allow me to share their club. We are open books. We will share our financials, our bank statements, uh, where the money comes, where it goes, to prove that none of it is going to the board members directly, that it all goes back into the club. And you're having more PAC shows being done by small groups that have none of that accountability. And I really think it's time for you to acknowledge that the PAC show should be used to benefit all the residents in those clubs and what we do here, not to personally profit a small group of people who aren't providing any accountability for their club in terms of numbers of members, in terms of board meetings, in terms of bank accounts or financial statements, and that those proceeds are not going right into specific people's pockets. So I think that has not been addressed in the past. And regarding the PAC, I hope you can talk about addressing that. Thank you so very much. Thanks. Thank you, Sharon. <clears throat> Uh, we have one more in-person speaker, and then one via Zoom, and then one email. So the next in-person speaker is S.K. Park. Good Thank morning, you. SK. My name is S.K. Park, 4008 2D. I'm pleased to announce that Yonsei Alumni Club of Laguna Wood Village announced annual autumn uh, classical concert at PAC 3. We are preparing to present to all everybody to join us to celebrate autumn classical concert. That is uh, October 18th, 2 p.m. at PAC 3. All the tickets are free. 
we Yonsei Alumni Association sponsor the 24-member concert, classical music. Beethoven 5, I believe, in Perth, they will play. So please join us and celebrate autumn classical music. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, next speaker is joining via Zoom, and that's Mr. James Jones. James Jones. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. <clears throat> All right. Uh, James Jones, uh, Manor 267C. Um, I have a problem I want to bring to the board. How do I show a video this way? I'm, I'm not used to Zoom. Can you walk me through showing? I, I, I have a photograph I want to show. Yeah, you're ready. Yeah, we, we won't be able to display anything at this time. I, I apologize. Okay, fine. I, I will send this to you so you can staff it around the board. Sure. Last, last May, I looked out my window, and I see a car being wrapped up like a Christmas present. And I ask, why is this car being parked here? And I was told that the owner was going on extended vacation, and security had authorized them to leave it. That was in May. It is still there. And I'm told now sometime in October they're coming back from this extended vacation. Well, it's been taking up a guest parking spot now for several months. The thing was wrapped up in a silver tarp, and it looks like crap. And I'm told that's okay. But if we perpetuate that, then there will be no guest parking, and... The areas around will look like, uh, I don't know, car dumps or something. Uh, and I'm told that they just followed the rules and it was okay. <coughs> and my, my investigation says that there is no place for residents to park their cars long term. Uh, and it's just not good. There are many places like over by the library where we have that large parking area that's not used, or other places where maybe we could make some arrangements for you know, long-term deep storage. But the current policy that allows people with security's blessing to park pieces of junk around for many months is just unacceptable. I raised this to the... Uh, uh, my mutuals aboard several months ago, nothing happened. So now I'm going up to the next level. And I would appreciate your investigation and doing something about this. Thank you, Mr. Jones. All right. And we have one uh, email that was sent in um, from James Hopkins. Uh, to be read today. So he said, as you know, on September 5th, 2024, I, along with Yvonne Horton, was recalled by vote of the corporate members, which is comprised of the mutual board members. The recall was initiated by the third board and was defined as without cause, as allowed by law. After three months of behind the scenes and other secreted maneuvering and gossip at the September the causes were disclosed. Obviously, I disagree with the decision, as did almost 1,500 petition signers, many of whom were part of the 300 residents who attended the meeting. With that said, I was very happy to see that we were able to get the residents interested in important committee meetings, and most of all, we got residents interested in the overall governance of this community. Corporate member meetings can be uninteresting, but are critical to this community, and too many residents and even mutual board members consider these meetings as private or not open to the residents. I sincerely hope that residents stay interested in the governance of this great community and seek to understand how the decisions made by a small group of directors impact the strategy and continuance of the governance of the community, which has been successful for 60 years. Thank you for your support. Stay involved. And that is all for open forum speakers. Thank you. Okay, uh, <clears throat> from my board, do we have any responses to any of the open forum speakers, Steve? To Sharon Peavy, uh, 
about the PAC sound system, um, that's going to be uh, under review in the closed session today. So you'll be getting some more information on the status of that um, presently. Um, to James Jones, vacation parking. Interestingly, we have a new resolution, which I believe we're going to look at today for the parking rules. And under section 7.4, it says that a resident's extended absence from the village, a resident vehicle may be parked in unassigned parking for more than 21 days for residents and seven days for guests under the following conditions. The resident's assigned parking space must be occupied during the same time by another resident vehicle, i.e. park in your carport, not outside. If you have two cars, well, um, as a courtesy to fellow residents, vehicles must be parked as far as practicable from units, preferably on a named street rather than a numbered cul-de-sac. Note the word preferably. Uh, there are a couple other things here, but um, it is possible to do that. You call security, you inform them, they're put on a special list so that they're uh, you know, not cited or whatever the case may be. So um, I'll direct you uh, again to the vehicle traffic and parking rules, uh, and that's uh, paragraph 7.4. Thank you. Any other comments from the board? Yes, Kush. As always, thank you, Chris, for the in important information that you bring us about the foundation and the help you guys provide. Um, to Mr. Jones, I agree that this may be a issue. We all have limited parking in our cul-de-sacs. I experienced that too. So I think I'm going to initiate a possibility to talk to security or whichever whoever is in charge of the RV parking that we designate a few spots for vacation parking and maybe charge a few dollars to the people if this is going to be over 21 days. It is a problem and I agree that and it looks like I don't want to use the word but it looks terrible. So I um, what else did I have to say? I think that's it. Thank you. I'll add to that that we will put it on the agenda for the Security Community Access Committee on October uh, 23rd. Uh, we have looked at it before when we did the rules, but uh, at that time, because of the building, <clears throat> One beautification, the parking lot next to the library was used for our uh, bus vehicles, etc., and was not uh, usable. So we may need to look at that again. Um, we also have charge there of the RV parking lots. So uh, Cush's suggestion that we designate a few spots there uh, can be taken into account. <clears throat> I'd just like to point out from the rules if you lease out your unit for one month, three months, six months, you're on vacation, you're gone, you lease out your carport too. But that doesn't mean that you can leave your car here parked somewhere else uh, because then you become a guest. You're not a member anymore. The person who is leasing your uh, unit is then the member. So uh, <clears throat> there are some things that need to be tightened up a little bit on that, I agree. Okay, I think that's... <clears throat> I encourage everybody to, uh, to come to the uh, expo. And uh, Sharon, it, it's, it's a very complicated problem with the sound system, which we will be discussing in detail this afternoon. Um, but <clears throat> small clubs have just as much right as large clubs. 
to use the facility and uh, so we, we can't discriminate in any way. And <clears throat> Ellen, the exceptions to the trust facility fee, I'd be happy to talk to you about that maybe after the meeting. And um, Mr. Leonard has been doing some in-depth uh, research for us on that, so he can be a party to that and help you understand it. Yes, there are some provisions that make it seem yes or no. So we'll do what we can for you there. Okay, on to item 10, which is our consent calendar. And we have only one item on the consent calendar. That's the recommendation from the Finance Committee. And I will entertain a motion to approve the consent calendar. I move we approve the consent calendar. And Kush, okay. Are there any objections to the, object, to the uh, consent calendar? Seeing none, it is accepted without objection. And now we get to unfinished business where we have five items. And we're going to start with a uh, Clubhouse One renovation, oral update. I see Guy West there in the back. I think he's going to give it to us. And this is exciting because we're in, folks. It's done. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you, Madam President. Um, good morning, Board of Directors. So I have a brief uh, statement uh, to acknowledge the opening. I am happy to announce the reopening of Clubhouse One for its scheduled soft opening on September 16th. This was truly a team effort across many departments. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the following departments and divisions for their contributions. General Services, Maintenance Operations, maintenance services, damage restoration, landscape, finance, and purchasing. Additionally, I would like to offer a very special thanks to the Recreation and Special Events team who worked tirelessly throughout the project. They single-handedly coordinated the relocation of all the clubs and activities, not a minor task. Um, the team of dedicated employees stopped, or I'm sorry, stepped in prior to the opening and literally rolled up their sleeves to ensure a clean and presentable facility. They continue to work with the project's team to coordinate the completion of the punch list items around the daily activities at the facility. I would also like to extend my thanks to the residents for their patience while the facility was closed. And as I said, this project is truly a team effort, and I want to thank everyone for their contributions. Thank you, Guy, and your staff. Uh, it, a major, major project was <coughs> finished, and I'm, I'm congratulating all of you. And certainly, as you mentioned, <coughs> to quote, it takes a village. All of the departments on our staff were included, and uh, particularly recreation did such a fantastic job of coordinating the uses while they were gone. Martin, you had a comment? <coughs> I, I just want to give Guy a special recognition. Um, I understand you had some struggles, like you, you turned into the, the project uh, super, or the construction supervisor doing the Gantt charts for the construct. I mean, you, you laid it all out for the contractor as they were not delivering. And I just want to thank you for keeping it on track. You did, you did a terrific job. The walkthrough we did, we were very impressed. And thank you so much. Thank you. I do appreciate that, but I, I have a staff that really support and supported this effort. But thank you for that acknowledgement. But it takes leadership, and that's what we appreciate. Thank you. Okay, are there any questions for Guy on uh, Clubhouse One? Seeing none, thank you, sir. Thank you. All right, <clears throat> item B, <clears throat> I will entertain a motion <clears throat> to approve the pricing rates for the electric charging stations. Uh, we, we, it was in... August and the 28 day has been satisfied. <coughs> Would you please read it for us, Madam Secretary? Yep. Resolution 90 24 double X pricing rate, rates for electric vehicle charging stations. 
Whereas the GRF board recognizes the need to amend the pricing rates for electric vehicle charging stations as necessary, and whereas the establishment of these rates are impacted by the electric rates adopted by Southern California Edison, SCE. Now, therefore, be it resolved October 1st, 2024, that the board hereby approves the following pricing rates for electric vehicle charging stations effective upon adoption of this resolution. For level two chargers, for the GRF fleet vehicles, zero, for Laguna Woods Village members and employees per kilowatt hour, 31 cents. Others, other users per kilowatt hour, 45 cents. Parking rates, $2 per hour after four hours. For level three chargers, for GRF fleet vehicles, zero. For Laguna Woods Village members and employees, 31 cents per kilowatt hours. Other users per kilowatt hours, 65 cents. And parking rates, $2 per hour after one hour. Resolve further that future revisions to the pricing rates for electric vehicle charging stations be based on the percent change adopted by SCE effective June 1st of the particular year and implemented by the Finance Department with an update to the Finance Committee and GRF Board after the adoption of the new rates. And resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution as written, I move we approve this resolution. Second. Okay. Seconds. It's been moved and seconded that we approve this, uh, and it's now up for any comments from the board. <clears throat> All right, I'll just make one. It's very important that last uh, <clears throat> resolved further because that means this doesn't have to be brought up to the board every time we need to make a change every year. We're at the mercy of SCE and how much they're going to raise our electric rates. And if we have to come back to the board every time they raise their electric rates in order to raise ours, uh, it makes it a little bit cumbersome. So this is going to be really good going forward in, in keeping those rates current with what uh, uh, SCE and the surrounding village are doing. All right, I will call for the vote. Are we going to vote on screen? Just via hands. Today. Just via yes. hand today, okay. All right, all those in favor? Any opposed? None. It's unanimous. <clears throat> all right, um, item C, entertain a motion to approve the golf fee recommendation. The September notification has been done, and... Uh, uh, Civil code has been satisfied for the 28-day review. Can you read that resolution for us, please? Yes. Resolution 90-24-XX, golf shared cost percentage, 35% versus 65%, member shared versus facility use fee. Whereas the golf fees administered by the Golden Rain Foundation of Laguna Woods Board of Directors adhere to the shared cost guidelines established in Resolution 90-12-132, whereby certain fees can be imposed upon users of various recreation facilities in order to control crowding and minimize overusage and to recover operating costs. And whereas, at the July 29, 2024 Finance Committee meeting, the committee endorsed staff's recommendation to establish a shared cost percentage of 35% covering total expense for golf maintenance and operations, including depreciation, leaving the remaining 65% of total costs to be recovered through golf facility use fees. And whereas at the August 8, 2024 Community Activities Committee meeting, the committee affirmed the Finance Committee recommendation to establish a golf shared cost of 35% or over 65%. Now, therefore, be it resolved October 1st, 2024, that the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby adopts the establishment of a shared cost percentage of 35%, leaving the remaining 65% of total costs to be recovered through golf facility use fees and resolve further 
that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized to carry out this resolution as written. I move we approve this resolution. I have a second. Martin. Martin. Okay. Any discussion? Do we have any response? No. Okay. All right. Um, then I'll call for the vote. All those in favor of this, please raise your hand. Unanimous. Okay. It's unanimous. Thank you. All right. Down to D. <clears throat> entertain, entertain a motion to approve the updated wait, 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 traffic wait, 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 fees. Wait, wait, wait. Excuse me. We're going to see uh, schedule of golf fees. That's what we just did. Well, I'm sorry. That was resolution. Uh, that was the percentage sharing. Now we have the schedule. It's a second resolution. It's 11C. Okay. I'm sorry. sorry. I missed that it was in two different parts. I know. All right. Would you read the second resolution? Right. Resolution 90-24-XX, Schedule of Golf Fees. Whereas the golf fees administered by the Golden Main Foundation of Laguna Woods Board of Directors adhere to the shared cost guidelines established in Resolution 90-12-132, whereby certain fees can be imposed upon users of various recreation facilities in order to control crowding and minimize overusage and to recover operating costs. And whereas the board directed staff to perform an annual review of golf revenue earned through fees compared to expenses incurred in accordance with Resolution 90-23-46. Staff will then propose fee changes, increase or decrease, to ensure that shared costs stay consistent with the board-approved percentage. And whereas at the July 29, 2024 Finance Committee meeting, the committee endorsed a $1 per round increase to each of the member greens for 18 holes and 9 holes on the 27-hole course, and 18 holes and 9 holes on the, at the par 3 course. The committee also endorsed increases for guest green fees, cart and club rentals, along with trail fees. And whereas at the August 8, 2024 Community Activities Committee meeting, the committee affirmed the Finance Committee endorsement of increased golf fees. And whereas at the September 3, 2024 GRF board meeting, the board approved an amended motion to adopt the fee recommendations endorsed by both GRF Finance and CAC with an additional $10 increase to all guest green fees above the then current rate. And now, therefore, be it resolved October 1st, 2024, that the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby adopts schedule of golf fees in Exhibit A below, effective January 1st, 2025, and Exhibit A of the golf, of the golf fees. Huh. <clears throat> for car registration, cart registration, the trail fee for single use uh, is increased from $8 to $10. The cart registration trail fee annual pass increases from $60 to $65. The car rental 18, for 18 holes increases from $15 to $18. The car rental for nine holes increases from $8 to $9. The car rental hand pulled increases from $1 to $2. It's a long list, sorry about that. Club rental increases from $25 to $30. Club storage locker annual fee, $45 increases, does not increase, stays the same. Club storage locker monthly fee, $12 stays the same. The driving range, a large bucket of balls from $6 to $6 stays the same. The balls, the driving range, small bucket stays the same. The driving range, quarter bucket stays the same. Uh, the green holes, green fee, 27 hole course, 18 holes. 
for members increases from $16 to $17. For guests, weekday increases from $35 to $45. Guests, weekend increases from $55 to $65. The Greens Fee 27 hole course, nine holes. Members increases from eight hours to $9. The guests weekday from $18 to $28. Guests on the weekend from $28 to $38. Greens fee par three, 18 holes. Members, $10 increases to $11. Guests increases from $16 to $26. The greens fee par three, course, nine holes. Members, $6 increases to $7. For guests, it increases $8 to $18. Resolve further that Resolution 90-18-03, approved on January 2nd, 2018, is hereby superseded and canceled. And resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized to carry out this resolution as written. I move we approve this resolution. Do I have a second? Who seconded? Do I have a second? I need a second. Okay, Martin. Martin. Okay, is there any discussion? Do you have any residence discussion? No. Okay, nothing on the board. All right, then we'll vote. All of those in favor, please raise your hand. Steve, are you against or Yes. Okay. Nay. Okay, one. Eight. One. Pass. Okay. All right. The vote is seven in favor, one opposed. Uh, the measure passes. No. All right. <clears throat> we'll go to D which is entertain a motion to approve updated traffic fees. The September initial notification has for 28 days has been completed and, and satisfied. Would you read that motion, please? Okay. Resolution 90-24-XX, schedule of traffic monetary penalties. Whereas at the July 29th, 2024 Finance Committee meeting, the committee approved staff's recommendation of the proposed schedule of traffic monetary penalties with an effective date of January 1st, 2025. And whereas the charge aims, the change aims to enhance adherence to traffic and parking regulations and reduce the frequency of violations. Now therefore be it resolved on October 1st, 2024 that the board of directors of this corporation hereby approves the revised schedule of traffic monetary penalties as attached to the official minutes and resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized to carry out this resolution as written. I move that we approve the schedule of traffic monetary penalties. Do I have a second? Martin. Okay. Martin again. Okay. Is there any discussion on the traffic rules? Donna? Yeah, I just want to point out that this is the increased fees are not an attempt to increase revenue. The purpose is safety of people in our village, and that comes first. And unfortunately, the smaller fees for speeding and running stop signs of $25, people just essentially ignore it, don't show up for the hearings in most cases, send in their check and continue driving as they have been. So... Um, it needs to have a little more strength, and perhaps that will get people to slow down a little bit and stop at the stop signs. So I just wanted to make sure that it was clear that this was not a revenue intent. It was a safety of our community. Any other comments? All right, uh, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor? Okay, it's unanimous. And we will go on to E, which is, <clears throat> I'll entertain a motion to approve the, re the revisions to the Golden Rain Foundation traffic rules and regulations. 
This has been a long journey, folks. <laughs> <laughs> it's very detailed. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, the was in, introduced in September, and the 28-day notification has been completed and satisfied. So would you read that motion, please? Right. Resolution 90-24-XX. Vehicle traffic and parking rules. Whereas the security department is responsible for the administration of the Laguna Woods Village vehicle traffic and parking rules. And whereas the Security and Community Access Committee has recognized the need to revise the vehicle traffic and parking rules with updates and clarifying language. Now, therefore, be it resolved on October 1st, 2024, that the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby adopts the vehicle traffic and parking rules as attached and as in substantially final form to the official minutes of this meeting and resolve that the resolution 90-1956 approved December 3rd, 2019. Resolution 90-19-25 adopted June 4th, 2019. Resolution 90-16-26 adopted June 7, 2016. Resolution 90-16-24 adopted June 7, 2016. Resolution 90-15-29 adopted May 5, 2015. And Resolution 90-14-21 adopted May 6, 2014 are hereby superseded and canceled and resolved further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. I move that we approve this resolution. Okay, you have a second, please. Donna. Donna. Uh, and I would just like to say this has been a labor of love for me for the last couple of years. Uh, we have worked very hard to do this and get it uh, together. As you can see from that resolved further, we've been band-aiding this for years as things came <laughs> up. So now we have a good, solid policy. Martin? <clears throat> can the committee chair just hit on some of the highlights of the changes? Is that possible? Yeah. Because there's quite a bit. It's in the... It's in the yeah, I, I don't. Uh, in the, the top three report, or four bullets. I, I can, <laughs> uh, under discussion. Okay, go ahead. Primarily, they did. Uh, they had to remove applicable uses of the term decal. We no longer use the decal. We had to include applicable uses of the abbre abbreviation RFID. So that was another edit. Then it had to include the term e-bikes for electric bicycles, and to revise the formatting. Those are the major changes. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. All right, I'll, I'll call for the vote. All those in oh, favor? There is a member comment. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, Richard Rader. Hi, thank you. Um, unfortunately, I wasn't here when you first uh, had uh, noticed this 28 days ago, I guess. Um, some people that I know have told me that when they're walking on a sidewalk, the golf cart comes up behind them, you don't know it's there. And what happens is suddenly, boom, they come right by you. And that throws somebody off or they get scared. My, my suggestion is, maybe it's too late to do it now, but you may consider that golf carts that are um, traveling on sidewalks, maybe they could buy an inexpensive little horn that kind of alerts people that they're behind them. It doesn't have to be digital, just a horn. Or maybe, maybe their voice, I don't know, but I've had some people tell me about that. The other thing I wanted to ask you was, uh, who, who conducts the traffic school? Our officers. Okay. okay. Security so, team. Right. And I'm just wondering, who pays for that? A violator or a shared cost? It's a shared cost, but basically. They pay $20 to attend traffic school. Well, to me, I would suggest that you consider it just a traffic violation. I don't pay through shared costs for somebody who violates speeding or goes through a stop sign. 
And similarly, I would treat Baptist school the same way. So I encourage you to take a look at, at some point, what it costs for traffic school and that uh, the people who are violating, that they pay for it. Thank you. Uh, we have one more in-person speaker, and that's Maggie Blackwell. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, I've been on the committee. Uh, we did the, the issue of the carts. We discussed putting a horn on the carts and having them be a horn behind walkers, and we decided that might frighten the walkers more than anything else. <laughs> and we, people are now using their headphones and talking on the phone, and they're on the radio or wherever. And so it's very difficult to get their attention. So we're, we didn't come up with any solution to this. It is dangerous. It's mostly over in the one section. But a horn will <laughs> shock them. And uh, that's, that's the, the difficult. Thank you, Maggie. <clears throat> Yes, Martin. Uh, the gentleman said sidewalk. I don't believe golf carts are allowed to ride yes, on they are. sidewalks. On, yes, they, they are in El Toro. On El Toro Road. Uh, okay, That's why they Toro, made those yeah. extra wide right sidewalks. Right there. But, but within the village itself, it, Yeah, no. in the village, no. But uh, so it's, it's the cart paths that, uh, uh, or the walk paths. That, and the uh, same with bicycles. But correct. it also says, uh, big sign, watch out for pedestrians. Yeah. I.e., golf carts should be very vigilant. Now, this has been a, uh, a controversial topic for a while, as far as uh, you know, frightening pedestrians uh, and carts just zooming by, and, and uh, you know, we just got to be courteous. It's about a matter of just um, uh, being nice, you know, to each other and, and giving them a heads up. You're coming by. Thank you. Any other comments? Now I'll call for the vote. All those in favor, please say. Raise your hand. Gan? Gan? Are you voting for this? Okay. It's unanimous. Okay, that takes care of our unfinished business. Let's get on to new business. And uh, the first item, A, is a motion to approve a supplemental appropriation of up to $45,000 for the Pickleball Feasibility Study. And would you read that, please, Madam Secretary? Resolution 90-24-XX, Pickleball Facility Request. Whereas at the February 8, 2024 Community Activities Committee meeting, the Pickleball Club made a presentation requesting the creation of an ad hoc committee to explore the building of a new pickleball facility due to the growing demand of residents playing the sport. And whereas the CAC voted to recommend the, recommend the creation of an ad hoc committee, including Community Activities Committee and Maintenance and Construction Committee to assist with the pickleball club request. And whereas the ad hoc committee request was not included for Golden Rain Foundation GRF board approval, but staff was directed to meet with the Pickleball Club to further discuss the process for building additional courts within the community. And whereas it was suggested by staff that the Pickleball Club first demonstrate the need for additional courts by, by hmm, I think, oh, garnering support from residents through an interest list and return to the CAC with a proposal. And whereas at the July 11th, 2024 meeting, CAC meeting, staff was directed to place the Pickleball Club presentation of exploration of a new Pickleball facility to be placed on the agenda for discussion. And whereas on October 8th, 2024, August the Community 8th. Activities Committee reviewed and recommended a supplemental appropriation from the Facilities Reserve Fund in the amount of $45,000 for a pickleball facility, I'm sorry, pickleball feasibility study 
to develop and review options for building a new pickleball facility. And whereas it is anticipated that available land to build a new facility would need to be reviewed and surveyed by professional consultants, including but not limited to geographical surveys, environmental impact report, etc., and whereas the estimated cost for a feasibility study is approximately $45,000 and funding is not included in the 2024 capital reserve budget or forecasted for the 2025 capital budget. Now, therefore, be it resolved October 1st, 2024, that the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby adopts a supplemental appropriation from the facility's reserve fund in the amount of $45,000 for a pickleball feasibility study to develop and review options for building a new pickleball facility and resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution as written. I move that we approve this resolution. Okay. Do I have a second? Donna. Donna. <clears throat> okay. Discussion. Discussion? Steve? Um, so I'm not in favor of this resolution for several points. One, my own research leads me to believe that this improvement will exceed $500,000, which means it'll have to go to the corporate members for approval. To spend $45,000 to do a study that's gonna require environmental, professional analysis of land, geographic studies, the rest of this, I can just see this becoming a huge thing. And I think the more prudent course of action here is to direct staff, either through recreation and or uh, projects, to find available information and in public record from surrounding communities such as Laguna Niguel or San Clemente or Liso Viejo, wherever pickleballs have been recently constructed, and find out what the costs of those projects were, which would not entail having to put forward a $45,000 investment on a project that I don't believe is going to garner corporate member approval support at over $500,000 eventually whenever we get there. The other thing is, I don't know where you'd put this. I mean, the, you're That's talking the nature about- nature of a feasibility study. You're, you're talking about taking some very valuable property to expand for recreation. Thank you. Martin? Well, we saw the one map that showed, they were looking at the vacant land over here, uh, gate 12. And I will say I won't rent a room at the Ayers Hotel if that's the case because I'm not I would not want to be listening to that. <laughs> I mean, that it, that would drive me crazy. Uh, I don't know that that's part of the environmental impact study, mm -hmm. uh, but it's just uh, there's there's this thing needs to be thought out carefully. Thank you. John, this was. I understand that this was to be presented to the uh, Finance Committee before we reviewed it. Was this done? Did the Finance Committee see it? It says, prior to GRF Board review, the request will be presented to the Finance Committee for review and recommendation. Was this done? Yes, please look at page three of 10. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yes, because we're, we're <clears throat> knocking just the feasibility study. Any other comments from the board? I'd like to make just a couple. Uh, <clears throat> we are not looking at just that one piece of land. Uh, that's the whole point of a feasibility study. We have quite a few pieces of land within Laguna Woods Village that are possible. We don't know feasibility, if they are going to work out or not. There's also the feasibility of covering uh, the existing courts so they could be used 
more in the daytime than they are now. Right now, they're mostly used more early morning, later afternoon, and evening because it's too hot. It's just too much. So there are different alternatives that would be looked at in this feasibility study. And just as a funny fact, television this morning, pickleball is the uh, biggest rise in emergency room uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> people going into the emergency room uh, over the last year, and uh, it's primarily with people of our demographic that um, are having trouble, so <laughs> just throw that out there. All right. <clears throat> we have a motion on the floor. It's been seconded. I'd like to take a vote, please. We do have a, a member uh, who's oh, got another speak. member. Okay, good. Yes. good. Um, Miranda McPhee. Good morning. Um, I'm Miranda McPhee, 531B. I'm also the president of the Pickleball Club. Um, I have a slide that I would like to show you that underscores the size of the problem we're dealing with. We don't think this is going to be an easy solution. We already know that. Um, I would also like to address the point about noise. There are silent walls now, and there are noise abatement. The industry is doing an awful lot precisely for the, the question of residents and, and, and noise. Um, this slide you may be familiar with because we show it at every um, committee that we stood in front of. But it's not the same as the last one you saw because we he keep having to revise upwards the numbers. It's a graph of the demand for pickleball in Laguna Woods. The club members are in blue. The estimated number of non-members, which we don't have the ability to track, are in pink. By the end of November, we project 600 members who want to play with an estimate of 110 non-members. That means we have over 700 member, um, players for seven courts. As of this morning, this slide is now out of date. We've had a surge last week. We have 598 members of the club already, and our introductory class is always full. I'll speak to the accident question. I did break my foot two and a half years ago, and I've just competed in the English Open. So what goes around comes around. It's, it's possible to you know, um, recover as well. And if people stretch and they do what they're supposed to do, the accidents tend to be uh, far less. But we do have an awful lot of people playing. For anybody not familiar, we navigate along busy golf cart paths to reach the courts and restrooms because we do not have bathrooms, we don't have a clubhouse, we don't have indoor storage, swipe cards, cameras, we don't even have hot water. But more than that, we don't have enough court space, even if we play um, all day. As we all know, pickleball is now woven into the sports fabric of this country and this community. So our numbers are going to keep growing. In five to six years' time, we expect 900 players on seven courts built for 250 players. That is a huge number of residents who want to play a single sport. Mm. We did conduct a short interest poll across the village and we have 1,064 residents' voices who support more courts. So we are asking and urging you to approve some financing. We need to resolve this problem and give residents the better opportunities to play one of our most active, social and popular sports that we have. Thank you. Thank you. We actually have one more okay, in-person speaker, Miranda. too. What's the next one? Uh, Ellen Leonard. Do you have a question? Well, I have questions for her. All right. <laughs> yes, Wait, Martin. Stay. Um, I know there's a, like a lobbying, you know, where you lob and, and you need height for yes. that lobbying. But, I mean, would an awning like what is over Pool 1 uh, high enough uh, be sufficient for, you know, shade that would give you a lot more playing time on the existing courts? I mean, $45,000 would probably pay for that awning. No, an awning, an awning is extremely expensive because we'd have to deal with wind. It gets very windy on the courts in the afternoon because of the Santa Ana winds. So ah. there are all sorts of things that would need to go into that. Um, and this 45,000 is to look at Yeah, right. it's just uh, for the options. study. Yeah. Yes. And actually, um, one of the things that we teach everybody, because of the lobbying, is never to run backwards. 
But one of the things that we can't do, we have 256 beginners. We don't have the court space to reserve to teach people to play, to play well and to, you know, to improve their, their game and to play safely. That's and that's an issue for us as well. OK. It, it is an option, but 900 doesn't go into seven, whichever way you cut it, because it's never going to be an even slice oh, throughout yeah, the day. Oh, yeah, you've got a lot of. Thank you. Donna has this question. Donna, did you have a question for her? No. No. Okay. Well, let's comment. get Ellen's comment. Yeah. Um, did we have the ad hoc committee meeting for this? Because originally this came to the CAC and we agreed that we would do an ad hoc committee before we would spend any money. So has that been done? That's what we're voting on. The resolution is for an ad hoc committee. <clears throat> well, yeah. it's, not, it's not for an ad hoc committee. It's for a supplemental appropriation. Uh, I think we jumped to that. No. <laughs> yeah. Even the ad hoc, uh, I take it back. We should have an ad hoc committee. Yeah. Yeah, it is for uh, creation of an ad hoc committee, but they have to have funds to be able to. Uh, so we will do that before yes. they get approval. Before you approve this, no, resolution? we would give forty-five thousand um, dollars in from reserve as needed for their ad hoc committee to do the feasibility study and decide what needs to be done. So an ad hoc committee will be put together of yes. directors, or I'm just curious. How I'm sure there will be advisors from the community on it. Nice. Okay, and who gets the money? The advisors from the community? No, no it pays for, for uh, if they need consultants or uh, I don't think it's well defined. I think it should be better defined, but I really think we should do the ad hoc committee and put this on the table. I object to it. Um, I think that the Pickleball Club has come to every single committee every single uh, board meeting. I think I've heard their presentation about seven times. I think we need to put, go back to the, what the CAC had said and, um, and put together an ad hoc committee. Thank you. It was not included under background. Right, I understand. Okay. In the staff report, it says that uh, the ad hoc committee was not included um, in board approval for this supplemental. So uh, that's CAC. Uh, Allison, do you know where we are on that? Morning, President Skillman. Um, yes, and initially there was a request for an ad hoc committee and it was denied. Um, they did not want an ad hoc committee at the time. GR Ford did not want an ad hoc committee at the time. And so we were advised to go back and meet with Pickleball, just staff um, with the Pickleball Club to come up with options. Uh, so that's where we're at right now. The, the Pickleball Club has come back several times. We keep kind of going in a circle. Mm -hmm. So um, if you want an ad hoc committee, we're happy to do an ad hoc committee. But at the time, it was, it was not requested to go forward. Thank you. Kush, you had a comment? Yeah, thank you. I understand pickleball has uh, become very popular at the moment, and it's like a phase thing, and suddenly it will go, some other sport will come up. And it may not be very smart on our part to just jump and spend the money and build more courts. We do have place around the pickleball courts. In case we want to do that, we may want to explore the idea of adding one or two courts over there, or three maybe. But I don't think we should spend a bunch of money to do this feasibility and build another facility. So we have pickleball in Clubhouse One, we have pickleball in the golf course area, and then we have another pickleball somewhere else, and suddenly all of them will become redundant because this phase of people will... It just happens like what happened outside uh, the video club. There was a... What, was, what kind of court was it that became a green patch now? Uh, it became a passive park now, but there was some kind of a game uh, thing 
over there. Shuffleboard. Was it shuffleboard? I don't remember which thing it was. So it's like that. It keeps coming in and coming out. We have two big buildings of uh, shuffleboard things. One is hardly used. One is now being shared with archery. So we need to really think about it in a smart way that we don't go spending money to just do feasibility study. We don't need people to think for us. We can think too. We've been educated people and smart. We've been around the world and we know how things happen. So I am totally against spending $50,000 just to listen to some people tell me, oh, we should do this or we should do that. That's my point. Any other comment, Jonathan? Yeah, um, I like to take the opposite view. At first, when I first heard about it, I thought, gee, you know, you spend the money, do we really want to do that? But, and I, your point is well taken, Kush, but sports and, and things that people get this involved in tend not to suddenly disappear. They build very slowly, and if they're going to wane, um, tennis hasn't waned yet, so um, you know, we aren't guaranteed that, that this would wane. But if they were to, it, tend, it would tend to be over a very long time. It, and I, I can almost anticipate we are still in a phase where this particular sport is growing. Um, I believe you've already experienced it. I've heard about it. I think many of us have. It is, it is now on this tra trajectory of going up and growing and increasing, which means that at some point, this question is going to come back to us again of do we need to look and see if and where we could build courts. We've heard concern. I'm, I wouldn't stay at the, the Ayers Hotel if I'm listening to the ball banging. <laughs> um, I don't want it next door to me while I'm trying to sleep. We don't even know what we have that could accommodate something. What we do know is that currently this, this sport is growing. It's getting more popular. It isn't even, I don't think, close to reaching its climax of, of people. And it might be that it'd be best to know now rather than later whether or not we even can accommodate any courts, and if so, how many we ever could accommodate. What we do know is that um, inflation tends to move upward. Uh, we don't see costs going down, so this might be a bargain to do this study now and have it done and know whether or not we could even do this in the future so that when it comes up and comes up again, if it does, We've already got the answer at a better price. So, so my thought, initially I was not in favor of it, but as I'm thinking about what the evolution of sports and things and the fact that we really don't know what the answer would be, where and if, uh, that I, I would at this point be in favor of doing the $45,000, which might save us a great deal in the future. Okay. Martin? I agree with uh, Kush. It's it, right now, it's the trend. It's the fad that, you know, what pickleball is doing. Um, you know, we've seen in, you know, recreation, we've seen lawn darts come and go. We've seen ladder golf come and go. Now we're there in the cornholing, right? Uh, that seems to be the big uh, thing to do for the backyard. Um, uh, what I'd like to know a little bit about, and maybe this in the, some kind of a study, that have we had a reduction in uh, the number of people that are playing tennis that have moved over to pickleball? Have we had a reduction of people that are, was doing lawn bowling and they moved over? You know, where are we moving to? I think, that, you know, there, there seems to be a, a, a trend of change in recreation, and I just want to know, you know, that we're using all the resources that we have. If we're vacating other courts, and, you know, it just needs to be looked at as a whole. Thank you, John. I want to remind you of shuffleboard years ago. And it was a big sport and became a very big sport, and we built courts to accommodate it. Now we've changed, and we're in the next phase. And there's nothing wrong with that. My point is that there is going to be some rising sport no matter what we do. And right now, pickleball is in the fore foreground. And if we don't pay attention to it, we're going to be overrun, I think, with pe pickleball, people desiring pickleball, not being able to play it. And so I'm in favor of the, uh, the study, because we need to do that 
before we make these final decisions. Okay. And uh, <laughs> you keep over here. Kush, you have one more. Did you? Yes. Uh, please don't misunderstand me. I am not against pickleball. I like people to play games, and it's very healthy to do that. What I'm trying to say is that we don't want to get this spread out all over the place. We have a facility at, at the golf course where there are seven courts. Maybe we should consider to think about adding something over there, maybe a small building with toilets and bathrooms so that it becomes a facility with courts. There are seven over there, put three more, five more, whatever. But don't have it scattered all over Laguna Woods. That's what I'm trying to say. And I don't think we need to spend $50,000 or 45, whatever, to, for somebody to tell us, oh, that's a great idea, you know. So that's what I'm trying to say. We can all brainstorm, see the facility, see what the, the plus and minus signs are about it and do it. I'm not saying not to play games. I used to play myself. For other reasons, I had to stop. But think about it that way. Okay. I'm against spending the $50,000 for somebody to come and tell us, oh, we could do that type of thing. So that's my point. All right. Yeah. <clears throat> Donna? It was just... Um, Martin just brought up an interesting point when he said we don't know if tennis has gone down, but we do know we have tennis courts. A feasibility study would say, you know, you've got tennis courts that are not being used. I don't know the answer. I'm just saying that the study may tell us we've got tennis courts not being used that would very well be adapted to pickleball. The fact is we don't know the answer. Um, Steve's objection is well taken. We don't want to spend it. We'll be looking at half a million dollars in the future, but that may or may not, or, or greater. But that may or may not be the case because it may be that there is something existing if, in fact, tennis were to go down. So all I'm saying is it's better to make a decision based on what we know rather than what we anticipate, such as noise, et cetera. So, so I just wanted to clarify that, that the, the spots may be there or not. Or maybe they're going to say, you know what, you have no place you could put anything, so stop the discussion. We don't know that. There are a lot of what-ifs. Yeah. <clears throat> Egon? Yeah, I agree in general with what Kush has said so far. Again, I'm not against pickleball, and, and I understand that we need to probably increase the number of courts. But uh, right now, we don't even know we would like to get some number from the pickleball group as to how far you want to go on this so that we can decide if we want to make it one. And I would think you would want to make it one facility. He, as, as he said, you don't want to have them all scattered all over the place. That doesn't make any sense. So right now, we don't even have a clear picture of what it is you want to study with $45,000. And with the amount of uncertainty that's in the picture right now, I doubt that the $45,000 is going to get you anywhere. It's not going to get you the answer. Steve. Thanks. I just want to reiterate. <clears throat> My recollection is that I read someplace that um, the plan was to build 14 additional courts. Say at $50,000 a court, that would be $700,000. And that would, I imagine, being... Um, constructed on property that is ready to have courts put on it, open space, grass, something, not mounds of dirt between Clubhouse 5 and the admin building. Again, if you're going to be upwards of a half a million dollars and the corporate members don't want to do this, all the time and the money that we spend to develop this will have been for naught. Again, Several surrounding communities have built pickleball courts in the last three to five years here. I've even read where some have closed some of their courts. If public entities have spent public monies to build public facilities for pickleball, there should be a record of what those costs were, 
how long it took, and again, if we can get staff, either through projects and or recreation, to find out this information, we'll have more information. I don't know why we have to pay for information that is publicly available. Thank you. Can somebody please silence their phone? By the way, I am not against pickleball. <laughs> it's, it's the money. <clears throat> All right. Uh, <clears throat> Michaela. Um, we have two resident speakers. Uh, the first one's Nancy Carlson. Good morning, board. To the point, not pro or con, just a point of information. I worked on the uh, GRF Space Planning Committee. And so I have pretty intimate knowledge of most of the facilities at this point as a result of that process. To Donna's point, remember when we all started skiing, for those of us who skied, and then those little rascals with snowboards appeared? <laughs> what the heck? Now it's 50% of the ski slopes, if not more. I think tennis and pickleball have that kind of same growth analogy. If you do one, you might start out in one, and then you move to the other. It's just a point of information for contemplation. The second thing, just as another further point of information, is to Cush's point, at Clubhouse 1, we have two buildings conjoined, total 9,000 square feet. Between the two buildings is 1,200 square feet with a little kitchenette. Now, in the master plan that we put together for space planning, provided that we could move table tennis, for those of you who are there, table tennis into those buildings and accommodate quite a bit. Table tennis wants to be in an office building. I'm not here to decide or replan anything, but I just want to talk to you about where there are options within the facility. And Clubhouse One provides new locker rooms, new showers, a gymnasium, a fitness center, <coughs> which is conducive to people doing running and jumping around sports who may want to shower before and after. The 9,000 square feet, those two buildings have new windows, new cooling systems, not necessarily air conditioning, but swamp cooler type systems, I think, so it, it deals with that extreme heat. So there are some possibilities that if, in fact, you chose to do a feasibility study, you have some things in this campus already that could be proved useful. And again, I'm not making the, the ceiling height. There is almost two, it's two stories. You have ample room. You could play tennis in there. You could play volleyball in there. The shuffleboard it was moved in there. And in the master plan, we moved the shuffleboard over to Clubhouse 4, where there's one huge, long building, and put all the courts inside there. So. <laughs> There are some musical chairs, but it's not expensive and it's not complicated. And one other thought about this concept, and again, this isn't making decisions, but when you put in a tennis court or a pickleball court, you've got a solid surface floor. And if you want to do some special events in the evening, a concert, a dance, you have the ability to take it out and you have a big open bullpen space that you can do it. So you get multiple functions and multiple uses out of it. So those are my comments that I think might be helpful to you right. relative to Thank approving you. a resolution on advancing this. Thank you. We actually have a few more speakers. Um, the next speaker is Vicki Choi Ho. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hi, uh, my name is Mickey Choyo. I'm serving for the Finance Committee of the GLF. We have had a long discussion last time we met, and um, we have a lot of options that we do not know. That is the reason why we need this study. And as Donna uh, pointed out, that was the whole uh, discussion. And then we had the final um, a resolution came that we decided to amend the motion up to $45,000, and 
and also not only for the building, the, I mean the amendment for not for the uh, development of a new facility, but we like to study the best option, what could be. I'm wondering, my first question is, I'm wondering why the resolution did not reflect on that amended resolution. And uh, so that is my question. And the second question was, I asked the staff where that $45,000 came from. And, and some board members uh, uh, raised that question. And the staff already did some preliminary study that we might, uh, I mean, $45,000 will be sufficient enough to do the uh, preliminary study. What option could be the best for us? Where to build or, uh, I mean, modify the existing facility, so on. So that was our finance committee's decision, but it was not reflected upon here. So that is my question. And Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next speaker is Marie Collins, and then Sue Kwam will be joining via Zoom. Good morning. From 30,000 feet view, um, I think all of us in this community were kind of in a bad shape for money. Okay, I think everything that we decide from here on out needs to be looked at as a want or a need. We have needs that are really wanting right now, okay? That's number one. Number two, I really like what director, uh, I'm sorry, what's your name? Leonard. It's a, uh, Steve, okay. Um, we have a very fine staff at VMS that can easily communicate with the people that Steve's talking about who've done this, and so if for nothing, we can talk to people who have done it and see how much it costs. That would be very valuable information before we make this decision about paying for a feasibility study. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Marie. Thank you. And then Sue? final speaker will be Sue. Let me pull her into the Zoom. Hi. Uh, when you asked about the use of the tennis courts, when the pickleball people came in, the, tick, uh, the tennis people also uh, spoke at I please don't uh, restripe our courts or take away our usage. So, you know, we, that was considered because I thought, why not just restripe it? And uh, putting a a structure that would allow more usage, whether it be tennis or pickleball, like Steve was suggesting, seems like a good plan if we knew how much that was. And, you know, the ad, if you have an ad hoc committee, you still have expenses. So I don't know how much that would be, but I do like Steve's suggestion about gathering our information first. And, you know, but there. Sure, we're you, using sir. the land in the most appropriate manner. Okay, thank you. Helen, you had another comment. Juanita, thank you. I'm sorry. I want to make a suggestion. Let, let, let's hear her. And Do we have okay. some? Oh, sorry, I didn't know you were. Okay, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I just wanted to comment that maybe we could use the hut. 45,000 and put a smart card system over there at the courts and do an actual uh, check and who, see who's checking into the courts. Or, and w the smart card system is something we spoke about before. But I also want you to look at the lawn bowling. They, uh, I've never seen anybody over at lawn bowling. Very rare. I don't even think I've ever seen anybody over there. So I think we need to be real careful about this and maybe put it together an ad hoc committee with um, directors and uh, the membership. So thank you. Good idea. I was, I was going to suggest that we put this, I, I don't know how to say it, but we bring this back next month with more information, proper information, 
uh, postpone it, the decision today. Do you want to send it back to CAC or do you just want to postpone it for another 28 it days? Didn't, I'm not sure if it came to CAC with all this information. It came from the finance and it just... So maybe if it came to CAC, we'll be able to do a little better study of it. You read this, you'll see it did. Hmm? Pardon? It did come from CAC. It did, but it came only partially from CAC. Most of it was already uh, thought of at uh, finance. So we just approved that. All right, uh, Gan, did you have a comment? I thought I saw your hand. No? Sorry? Gan. Yes. Martin. Um, what Mickey <clears throat> was saying about uh, what we saw with the $45,000 uh, thing with finance, it, it, there was a particular plot of land that was, that was considered. And, and I'm, I'm concerned about this feasibility study. Is it just focusing no. on that? We, or we is it, it looking um, uh, community? Where did it say that then? Because that's of concern. Also, too, like I said, the uh, the other recreational uh, activities. This fees if you're going to do a feasibility study, be all inclusive with regards to what's trending is is what I'm I'm, I'm referring to. So. Um, you know, I just don't want to see 45 grand going into like doing soil samples over in the vacant lot and stuff like that. That's of concern. Thank you. Joan, did you have a comment? Again, I'm sorry, I keep calling you, you're not there. <laughs> I am listening different sides. And one thing is concerning me, what, what is happening to our uh, billiard boards? what happened to our shuffleboard. And I think people have a different way and at different times to hit a ball. They used to hit a ball in the billiard, billiard table. That is excess we have right now, as I understand. It is not properly used and fully used. So is the case with the shuffleboard. If we have a feasibility study today and spend $45,000, I'm definite, it is definite that there are enough supports from enthusiasts and members to go for additional uh, courts for, for, to accommodate all the people. And I have a feeling that uh, this craze for some particular games come and go and just like, you know, billiards is gone and shuffleboard is gone. Um, so I think we have to think about it whether we spend $45,000 to figure out whether we need it or not. Maybe, you know, maybe we should spend that money and be sure that this is the thing to stay for a while and it is worth having this course built or made someone else. That is the concern I have. What if that we don't need it in future anymore and there are some empty courts? Thank you. <clears throat> I, I have one comment I'd like to make. Before. Uh, first of all, I hope you all listened and read the uh, uh, resolution that uh, we had and basically the feasibility study is to develop and review options for building a new pickleball it doesn't say where doesn't say when do we need it and where are some of the areas that could be and that would include the costs of a professional consultant not limited to geographical surveys environmental impact report etc so this is all information that we need uh, in order to go forward with any kind of resolution to expand the pickleball courts. And I don't think we have staff available <laughs> that could do this in their spare time. So I think that uh, that's what we're voting on. And I'd like to call the question. All those in favor of approving the supplemental appropriation for the pickleball feasible study, please raise your hand. Four. Okay. 
Okay, and those opposed? All right. It's four to four. So that means that the uh, motion dies, it does not pass. Juanita? Yes, Steve. Would it be possible to make a motion to direct staff to gather financial information on pickleball courts that have been built by municipalities within a 15 mile radius of us? Yes. Would that, can I make that motion? And would you, somebody you say You can. That? Uh, that's, uh, number one, do you know that they're coming to us? Because we are some of the newest ones that built the pickleball courts. So they want to know what we did and how much it cost before they did theirs. But, that would be my motion to direct okay, staff to motion, get information uh, from surrounding to ask communities. To direct staff to gather. I'll second that. All right, and Martin has seconded it. Information on the construction, their construction costs and timelines of facilities that they've built in the last three to five years or something, in the last five years, at least to give us some information of what we're possibly dealing with here for an overall cost for a project. All right, I mean, I, as, as I hear it, we've got a motion to uh, direct staff to gather information on construction costs in the last three to five years uh, at other facilities. And it's been uh, seconded. So, Martin. All those in favor? All right, seven, and I'm voting against, so it'd be seven to one. City, roads are swamped, gas stations out of fuel, many. <laughs> Whatever that was. All right, uh, so uh, the motion to approve the appropriation failed, and the motion to direct staff to gather more information for us uh, passed. All right, we'll go on to uh, 12B. Entertain a motion to approve operating hour adjustments on pool five with an additional hour for GRF uh, October 1st. Resolution 90-24-XX. Operating hours adjustment, pool five additional hour for October. Whereas on January 4th, 2022, the Golden Rain Foundation of Laguna Woods GRF Board of Directors Approved resolution 90-22-04 for pool operating hours and lifeguard services modification to modify pool operating hours and lifeguard services to enhance pool operating effic efficiencies. And whereas per resolution 90-22-04 pool five operating hours in October are 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. And whereas at the request of several residents on October 3rd, 2023, the GRF board approved resolution 90-23-57, allowing the extension of pool five hours to 7 p.m. for the month of October, 2023 only. And whereas staff was directed to reevaluate the request in 2024. And whereas on September 12th, 2024, the Community Activities Committee recommended board approval to extend Pool 5 operating hours in October from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. Now, therefore, be it resolved October 1st, 2024, that the Board of Directors of this corporation hereby adopts the extension of Pool 5 operating hours in October from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m and resolve further that resolution 90-22-04 approved on January 4th, 2022 regarding pool five hours is hereby superseded and canceled and resolve further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized to carry out this resolution as written. I move that we approve this resolution to extend the hours in October. Do we have a second? Aye. Donna. Donna. 
Any discussion? <clears throat> Seeing none, I'll call for the vote. All those in favor of uh, extending the operating hours on pool, pool five? It's unanimous. Pass. Okay, let's go down to C. Facility energy management presentation. I think I saw Manuel come in. Good. Good morning. Good morning, members of the board. Um, we were requested to bring to you a presentation for your review and discussion on the facility management programs that we have um, in the community. I think this was discussed at your last board meetings. Uh, there were some questions raised about what are we doing. And so uh, our presentation today is intended to um, hopefully answer some of those questions and uh, provide you with information. So um, first of all, we'd like to start off with here, the community center building. Uh, as, you, as you know, this building is uh, 60,000 plus square feet, three levels uh, housing both uh, administrative and recreational uses. And if you could go to the, there we go, we got it up there. Not on here. Um, so this slide shows you the uh, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning system here at this facility was uh, upgraded in 2019. It, ha it has with it a basic energy management system that allows our staff to uh, remotely access the system, make adjustments to temperature settings. Uh, it allows them to uh, check to see if the system is functioning properly uh, or not, and has been a very useful tool for our maintenance team as we uh, monitor the program here. The HVAC system has, is set at 72 degrees during business hours. Um, however, as you, I'm sure, are aware as you walk around the building, there are um, thermostats that can be adjusted some, uh, based on whatever use is going on. Uh, we don't lock those out. Um, so sometimes uh, temperatures do get adjusted. But again, uh, our default setting is at 72 degrees during business hours. During non-business hours, the system automatically uh, converts to an unoccupied setting. The unoccupied setting is set for 84 degrees for cooling. That means if the temperature uh, on any floor gets over 84 degrees, the AC will kick in and bring the temperature down to um, about 84 degrees. Similar for heating, it's uh, unoccupied setting is at 66 degrees. If the temperature falls below that, uh, the heating system comes on and brings the temperature up. And the reason for that is so that we don't completely shut down the system uh, because it takes almost over an hour to get that started up again. And we don't want to have to be doing that every day. And it's really not good for the mechanisms in the HVAC system. So that's very acceptable industry standard practice. The operating hours are shown on the table on the slide uh, for each floor and each day of the week. So for example, um, Monday through Friday, the first floor of the community center is at the business hour setting between 6 a.m. and 8.30 p.m. Um, after 8.30, the system goes into the unoccupied mode and then kicks back in again the following morning at 6 a.m. And you can see the times for each of the other floors uh, and also for the weekends. On the next slide, we have uh, want to talk a little bit about something that's referred to as the Melrock system because there's been some questions about that. So uh, Melrock is a company that has proprietary um, monitoring equipment that allows large campuses to monitor the efficiency of their uh, HVAC systems. Uh, the GRF board in 2019 authorized the installation of this mechanism 
Uh, it's, it's basically a small box that hooks into your system uh, that's tied to a software program proprietary to the Melrock uh, company. So that was added in 2020, according to our records. It was intended to analyze and monitor the efficiency of the system uh, that was installed then, a brand new system installed in 2020. Uh, the installation and, and annual subscription for that program was $6,300. I think oh, about yeah. 3000 was for the unit. And then there was an annual subscription uh, that uh, the system was going to send information to the company, and then they were going to send us reports. Um, and then we would take action on those reports if we saw something that needed to be addressed. Um, we've done extensive research of our records, and there does not appear that any reports were ever provided to GRF by this company. And also, it does not appear that we ever paid uh, for any of this work. <laughs> well, that's the reason. <laughs> so that's why there's no Probably why we didn't have Unfortunately, uh, there's nothing in the records to show why that happened. Uh, perhaps those board members that were here then have some recollection of that. But the system is not being used. Is, um, did you say now or not? It, it is not being used. Okay. It, 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 for all, as far as we know from our records, it never was. Um, and so, but we do have, again, our maintenance team is able to access the HVAC system remotely, make adjustments as necessary, but there is no monitoring by this third party vendor, which is what, what this was intended to do. It wasn't staff doing the monitoring, it was the third party vendor doing the monitoring and then reporting to us uh, what their findings were. Reporting to us if the system wasn't working properly, reporting to us what the uh, efficiency calculations they had on a monthly basis uh, through a subscription service. But again, it doesn't appear that ever happened and we're not currently using it and we're not recommending that we use it. The, um, the next slide shows some of the capital projects that the GRF board has approved to uh, support and enhance energy uh, efficiencies throughout the facilities. Um, in 2024, as part of the Clubhouse One uh, renovation project, the uh, lighting upgrades were made in the rooms that were part of the scope of the project. So all of those rooms now have new uh, LED lighting and dimmers and timers to help um, reduce the energy consumption when those rooms are not in use. In Clubhouse 7, the board also allocated funding in 2024 to upgrade the lighting in that facility, both inside uh, the building and in the parking lot. And so we're getting ready to uh, bring that to the board, I think, with a contract for that. Uh, I think it recently went out to bid. So Clubhouse 7 will then have um, current technology LED fixtures both in the clubhouse and in the parking lots. And then in 2025, the budget that you just adopted uh, last month has projects in 2025 that also uh, promote energy efficiency through your facilities, um, including uh, $100,000 for the a new HVAC system at the Clubhouse One Fitness Center, uh, also a new HVAC system at Clubhouse Seven. Uh, that system has uh, outlived its useful life. Parts are no longer available for it, and we continue to have uh, problems with it. So the board was uh, did approve funding for a new HVAC system there, and then. Um, Funding to add uh, energy management technology to Clubhouse 1, 3, and 5 to allow staff to be able to do the same monitoring that we do here at the community center at those facilities. And then lastly, uh, an allocation for lighting controls at GRF facilities. Uh, some facilities like this one um, don't have uh, remote sensors for lights. So, uh, and don't, don't also have dimmers. So uh, much like we did at Clubhouse One, uh, this money will be used at all Clubhouse facilities and community center to install 
dimmers and motion sensors so that the lights are only on uh, when the facility is being used. With that, I'll take any questions that the board may have uh, and appreciate the opportunity to present to you this morning. Thank you, Daniel. I'm going to start from this side. I have a question, Dan. Manuel. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking, to, I'm looking to make sure. Have you prepared here, right? this management system for uh, third mission? I'm sorry? Have you prepared this, this information for third mission? For third? This is GRA facilities. What about the third mutual facilities? Yeah, uh, all the facilities are GRF facilities, so third mutual doesn't have any facilities. Just the housing, and we have nothing to do yeah. with those. Uh, pardon? Just the housing unit that we have nothing to do with. Uh, but, but to answer your question, Third Mutual uh, at the MN, through the MNC committee has been looking at uh, like lighting and carports and um, vehicle charging and carports. But um, most of the lighting in the mutuals, I believe, is already LED lights, like walkways and uh, street lights and things of that nature. But and they don't have any facility. The reason I'm raising this point, I have gone to many, for example, I live myself in a garden villa, mm -hmm. and there are 47 or 50, 50 of those buildings, and all the lights are on all the time, during the daytime. And I questioned that, and I understood that the instrument that got regulates will cost a lot of money, and that's why they're not doing it. So I'm thinking whether you have any plan, or are they developing it's not, uh, uh, Third Mutual? No, we can't make any plans for Third Mutual. Third Mutual has to make plans for their own buildings. So I have to raise that question by Absolutely. going to their meetings? Yes. Yeah. But, okay, thank It has you. nothing to do with GRF. Okay, uh, around here. Um, oh, Martin, did you have, no, no Donna? Yeah, um, I was wondering if in the improvements that have been made here in this building, the energy management systems, you can't really learn anything by looking at whether costs have gone down because, of course, rates are constantly going up. But have you studied or gotten any feedback on, the ener on any energy savings? Because we can measure the energy that's used um, on some of these new things. Has, have, has it made any difference? You know, I, I've or not, not long I, enough. I don't believe we have analyzed that. Um, so we don't have that. We we, we haven't taken uh, yeah. our Edison bills and looked it's, at the historical trends. In yeah, and again, energy, it wouldn't be the bills. It, it would be the energy consumption that you could that you could. But you haven't done it. How long has it been since this building has had um, the updated systems in in functioning? Since uh, 2019. Okay, so it might be time. Um, I don't know if anyone else agrees, but it would be nice to know because I believe we are, at least from everything I've read and studied, that switching to some of these um, energy management systems should make a difference. And although we won't necessarily see our bills go lower because of the rate increases, they would be higher if we hadn't made the changes. So if, it, if it's possible to, um, and if the rest of the board agrees, to just find out what, it, has there been any savings? And if so, it would obviously be in either kilowatt hours or however you measure it in energy, just moving forward since we're considering an energy committee. I think that would definitely be something the energy committee would be looking at. But All we right. don't have that yet. Yeah, Egon, did you have your hand up? No? No, it was Steve. All right, Steve, go for it. <laughs> to Gan. Sorry, to Gan. Gan. Yes. Um, Third Mutual um, replaced all of their lighting, as did United, to LED with a few exceptions for floodlights around laundry rooms. Um, the concern you have about the lights being on are uh, primarily due to two factors. One, if a building has a uh, light sensor on it, it's on a certain wall on a building, and if that light sensor is not working, then the lights will just stay on. The other issue that third has is that, particularly in the Garden Villa buildings, 
Many of those buildings are on timers. Remember the old square box timers with a big yellow dial on it and you set it to go on at a certain time and off for a certain time? And those have to be manually configured at the seasonal time change and sometimes they are not. So now I'd like to address the presentation. If you could call back up the slide to the community center HVAC, please. Okay, so in theory, this looks good. In practice, it is not. Believe Having not. been in this building for over seven years, I have constantly been in this building on the weekends checking thermostats on the second floor and also the first floor. And I have a compendium of photographs of the thermostats. These thermostats uh, reflect that the temperatures on the weekends on, um, uh, in, in many of the areas are down at 65, 66, and 67 degrees in the summer. So if you're saying that the schedule setting is 72 degrees, it is my experience that it is 10% cooler on the first floor and second floor in this building. Um, interestingly, had a conversation with um, Bart Mejia and Ian Barnett last week, and we talked about the EMS system and what's available and what can be done and what's not available and what can't be done and the updates, the upgrades for plan for next year. And when I mentioned with the temperature in this building being very cold, 66, 67, 68 degrees in the summer when on the weekends when the floor is unoccupied, given we have a gymnasium at the far end of this building, Right, so that's being cooled. This weekend when I came in on the second floor and, the, and uh, particularly, it was 75 and 76 degrees. So the first time in my life in this building, having had the conversation with Ian and Bart about the temperature, something changed. The Melrock system was to be installed and several years of monitoring were prepaid, I believe, for a three-year situation. There was no prepayment, no. We paid $6,300. No. We paid nothing. No, we have no record that any payment was made. Well, then I'd like to direct staff to have the finance department find out if they paid anything to Melrock. We did ask the finance department. They found no record of any payment to Melrose. How did the system get installed? The they provided a system and installed it and never sent us a bill? No, they, they were not. Um, per, their, per their proposal, they were not installing anything. They provided the equipment for staff to install. I don't know what to say other than here we start a project to go into energy efficiency and study and collect data to make recommendations to save money when we spent $900,000 a year in electricity for GRF and now we spend $1.2 million five years later. We tried to implement a system. The system wasn't implemented for whatever reason. Um, I don't have any answers. Um, Clubhouse 7. I've reported this previously, and I haven't heard anything further. Uh, if you could go to the uh, slide for the Clubhouse 7, please. Okay, so um, not the HVAC system, the lighting. I think there was something for lighting. Was it the pre previous slide? Slide 4. There you go. 
Okay. Mm. Lighting upgrades, $150,000. New LED fixtures, ballast, 380 clubhouse lights, 41 parking lot lights. In 2019, I believe it was, no, 2017, um, GRF purchased two by two LED ceiling lights to completely replace all the fluorescent lights in the bridge room. The invoice was paid. The equipment was delivered. The vendor offered to install them at something like $45 a panel, and I think there were like 45 panels, $50 a panel times $45, several thousand dollars. Um, the vendor was told at this time, Ernesto, Ernesto Munoz was director of MNC at the time. Um, the, the, uh, the vendor was told, thank you, no thank you, we'll have our own staff do it. Three months ago, four months ago, when I became a member of this board, I went over to Clubhouse 7 and looked at the bridge room, and shockingly, all the fluorescent lights are still there some seven years later. The calculated savings on taking those fluorescents out and putting the LED panels in that had been paid for and delivered to the warehouse was approximately going to be something around... Um, of $5,000 a year. So we bought the equipment. It never got installed. It's supposedly sitting in the warehouse, but I still haven't seen any evidence. No one's gotten back to me and said, yeah, we found them there in a corner or they're not there, whatever. And I know this bill was paid if you go and check with the, with the vendor on that. So in the seven years since we bought those LED fixtures, we've missed an opportunity to probably save, including, I'll, I'll take COVID into effect. No bridge in the bridge room, right, for a year. We've probably lost $25,000 in savings and electricity in a single room over equipment we purchased and did not spend $2,500 to put in. So the other thing I want to say about Clubhouse 7 is that it is my recollection that Mark Stahl, when he worked here under MNC department, um, also arranged to have all the parking lot lights in Clubhouse 7 replaced with LEDs. The first one we ever did was PAC, as I recall. Uh, made arrangements to have that done at Clubhouse 7. The wrong uh, fixtures were purchased that would not accept 277 volts, and they were installed and they all blew up. And my recollection is that the proper LED fixtures were acquired and installed. So when I see something that says that the parking lot lights are gonna be converted to LED, I have questions. I guess at this point, My immediate greatest concern is that we have on the capital plan for next year spending $390,000 on Clubhouse 135 for EMS systems because they are outdated, which we know. And we've been working on EMS since 2000, 1998, something like that. And we've spent a lot of money. And I think Bill can verify this. And I would, I would guesstimate at this point, to date we probably spent more than a million dollars on EMS. And the EMS that we have is partial, and it's incomplete. And my real question is going to be, if we spend $390,000 on upgrading EMS in clubhouses one, three, and five, what is that return on investment? My my real concern is, yes, you can install EMS systems, but the conversations that I've recently had with staff have been that you can install the EMS, but we don't have the rest of the systems installed in the building to adequately be able to control the energy efficiency, such as ducts 
that have valves in them where you can open and close the individual valves so that you're not heating or cooling rooms that are not in use. We don't have that capability in this building. If we don't have that capability in Clubhouse 1, 3, or 5, and we install EMS, we're going to have the same kind of EMS function that we have in this building, which is either we're cooling or heating an entire floor, or we're not. So before we go spending $390,000, I've urged this board to direct staff to come up with what, how that's going to work and what that ROI is going to be. Because if we're just going to update our EMS system to bring it into a current digital communication <clears throat> protocol out, uh, against our outmoded Cobra jet, um, I don't see any point in spending money on an EMS system that's not going to give you some savings. Because I haven't seen the savings in this building. Well, I think we've just asked for them, haven't we? Sorry. We've just asked for this for the power savings. Well, you'd have to you'd have to develop if we spend three hundred ninety thousand dollars on these systems. What the, what is the projected return on investment? Yes, I just said we've asked for them, so that hopefully is going to be in progress. Well, I'm talking about what we're going to spend next year in the capital plan. So, so I'd like I'd like to suggest, okay. um, as we do with most of our major investment capital projects that you allow us to work with the GRF-MNC committee on the scope of these projects, uh, provide the information that the directors here are asking for, because obviously we don't have it today. Uh, I've made notes of those, and uh, we'll work. I would recommend that you give us the opportunity to work with the GRF-MNC committee to get that information before them um, so that we can get these projects moving. Well, I'd like to modify that and go down to uh, our next order of business, which is D, to establish a GRF Energy Subcommittee to the MNC Committee uh, to do this, <clears throat> uh, answer these questions and ask these questions, et cetera, and then bring it back to the MNC Committee. So uh, <clears throat> it's disturbing that things have slipped through the cracks. And we don't have uh, data uh, that we have paid for. Uh, Bill, I saw you come up. Did you want to speak? Yes. Some of you know that I'm an advisor on the GRF MNC committee. And the reason I'm there is because I've lived here 17 years, and I've seen so many transitions in this community. And you lose the history. I mean, it's a shame. But everybody that gets on a board has to get re-educated about what's going on on the board. I mean, and it's a long process. And uh, we're not young and agile of mind like we were when we were 20. Um, Donna, uh, there's a request into Guy West to give us financials on the broadband building where they changed the HVAC system. They upgraded the HVAC system to see if there is a savings from the old system to the new system, okay, in, in kilowatt consumption kilowatt and dollar, consumption and do and dollar amounts, okay? Thank you. So I'm hoping that that report comes on the MNC agenda either in October or the one in December. I don't know, a uh, uh, guy needed to, wanted to do a long range, you know, m multiple month thing to see sure. if, you know, over the seasons we were seeing some benefits from that upgrade. The other thing, Melrock. Uh, I think, is Bart still in the room? Yeah. Bart, did you go down? You went to the Claremont Colleges to talk to Dottie. We weren't able to do that, but we, uh, we talked to one of the college representatives. Okay. Well, some of us back in 2018, 2019 went up to Claremont Colleges. They have 57 buildings. And they implemented Mill Rock. But they have a full-time facilities manager who is looking at the reports real time. And they've been awarded multiple awards from the California Energy Commission for saving money. The professors up there and the students are ecstatic because now they're not freezing to death in the winter and sweltering in the summer because this system actually monitors the heating and the cooling in those buildings. So 
there's some benefit, um, but what it implies, and it's something that we talked about six or seven years ago, of getting somebody who is a dedicated facilities manager to look over the GRF buildings. Now, those people don't come cheap. I mean, I'm sure you're looking at $100,000 a year person in this day and age. Um, don't quote me on that. I'm not an expert. I don't work in HR, so I don't look at these numbers. But the real issue here is that I think we've got, what have we got, seven buildings, eight buildings in the community, wherever you want to look at them. Uh, Clubhouse One is a good example. You can replace one of the HVAC systems in the, there, but they've got multiple HVAC systems in each, each segment of, of the facility there. And so uh, three or four years ago, during COVID, they replaced the HVAC system, I think, over the gym. Uh, uh, I don't know what, what has transpired since then, but um, you're going to have to put in monitors in multiple places in some of these some of these buildings, so it's a it's a complicated project. So my time is up, and I thank you for your time and um, good luck. I hope you form the energy an energy subcommittee. Jim. Thank you. Maybe the energy, if we form it, uh, maybe the energy subcommittee can take the point on this by actually researching what we have and what we don't have and what's working and what isn't. I mean, and maybe not why, but whatever. But we need to know what we have out there that isn't working, that we've paid for already. And it seems to me that what Steve has said and what you said, Bill, would, would benefit us enormously to let staff work with an energy committee to research this and get it working again. I mean, we're wasting money like crazy, not, not using what we said we wanted. Anyway, that's my comment. Okay, Steve. So I just want to express an additional concern. <clears throat> we used to have a system where a committee would work with staff on developing scopes of work and RFPs and be present when um, bidders appeared to explain their bids. And something has changed in the purchasing procedures is my understanding because in trying to get information about the PAC sound system, um, my, my understanding is that the scope of work was developed by staff, that the RFP was developed by staff, that the bids were received and considered by staff, and it was only last week that the board received any of this information. And so when we talk about now, if we have a subcommittee in GRF for energy that will work with staff, okay, that we're going to get back on the rails, which we've apparently fallen off because both Juanita and I have asked for some of the information that went into that PAC study and it wasn't provided, and to, despite numerous attempts. I don't know what changed in purchasing policy here between 2019 and 2024, but my understanding is that, that Bunny Carpenter was very involved in getting that happen, and I think that the GRF board needs to seriously re-examine what those changes were in the purchasing policies so that we seem to have gone from one extreme to another and we need to find a better middle ground if we're going to manage these millions and millions and millions of dollars that we're going to be paying for things coming up within the next few years. So I'll leave it at that. No, I, I just wanted to remind the committee that we have 
Um, I believe Third Mutual's Finance Committee meets here in this room at 1.30. So if we are going to establish an energy committee and your points are well taken, that would best be have the discussion there and bring it back so we can okay. get out of here before we're evicted. <laughs> All right, well, if we go on, and, and thank you for the update, uh, Manuel. Uh, there are a lot of information there, a lot of questions that were raised. And so, um, with uh, D, I am going to make a motion to establish a GRF Energy Subcommittee reporting to the MNC Committee. Um, and I will appoint Steve as chair. Donna, would you be the other member on that committee to start with? Sure. Um, and Bill, I hope you will accept uh, appointment as an advisor to that committee. And I'm going to suggest to staff, we can't there, but just suggest to staff that perhaps Ian Burnett be the uh, staff member that works with them since he's the one that's so intimately involved with our current energy system. I second, second the motion. <laughs> okay, I have a move and second to <clears throat> any discussion. Kush? I have one thing to mention. It's kind of freezing in the room right now. <laughs> <laughs> Can we adjust the temperature? Yes, the thermostat and notch it up a few degrees. And well, I don't we're, want we're gonna, to be doing it. Okay. I'd like somebody to handle that, please. All right. Um, then I will call for the vote. All those in favor of establishing the Energy Committee. It is unanimous. Okay. All right. Uh, committee appointments. Now, uh, again, we have a short time. Our new organizational meeting for uh, GRF will be uh, November 13th at our annual meeting. And then the new board and the officers elected at that time will look at the committees and what they want to do, et cetera. So um, we're going to make some interim changes, and this is primarily for our administrative staff because they publish this to the other administrators, so who gets the minutes, who gets announcements, and all of that kind of stuff. So Joan, would you give us those changes? I really have only one major, well, okay, I'll go through. A resolution 9024XX GRF committee appointments. Resolved October 1st, 2024, that the following persons are hereby appointed and ratified to serve on committees of this corporation. Under Community Activities Committee, Yvonne Horton has been uh, eliminated, and Joan Melliman is no longer an alternate, but she's on GRF. Kush Bahada is GRF chair. And no change in Finance Committee. On the Information Technology Committee, James Hopkins, chair, has been eliminated. And Sue Kwam has been appointed as an alternate for United. Landscape Committee, no changes. Maintenance and Construction Committee, Yvonne Horton was eliminated as chair. Media and Communications, no change. Broadband Ad Hoc Committee, no changes. Mobility and Vehicles, no changes. Security and Community Access. No changes. Disaster Prep Task Force, no changes. Laguna Woods Village Traffic Hearings, no changes. Select Audit Task Force, no changes. Executive Hearings Committee, Yvonne Horton, chair, was eliminated. Space Planning Ad Hoc Committee, James Hopkins, chair, was eliminated. Yvonne Horton was eliminated. Ellen Leonard is the alternate for United. Uh, correspondent, uh, James Hopkins was, Hopkins was eliminated. Uh, El Toro Water District uh, remains the same. Resolved further that Resolution 90-24-44 adopted September 3rd, 2024 is hereby superseded and canceled. And resolved further that the officers and agents of this corporation are hereby authorized on behalf of the corporation to carry out this resolution. I move we approve this resolution. All right, Steve it's been seconds. moved and seconded, and I have some other changes that we need to oh. consider. I think, Martin, that's what you were looking at. Under ITEC, the Information Technology Advisory Committee, Martin Rosa will be chair for the next couple of months, and we're adding Steve Leonard so that we have two people from GRF on that committee. ITEC. Um, <clears throat> I will be chairing the Maintenance and Construction Committee. 
and uh, have added Steve Leonard to the MNC committee uh, for the next two months. Okay. This is all two months, folks. Say when that we again. get new people in, new boards, we'll say the last again. There. What did you just say? Um, maintenance and construction. I will be the chair, and Steve Leonard will be another member from GRF. Um, the space planning ad hoc committee. <laughs> We kind of did away with that, uh, and I thought we had taken it out, yeah. but we haven't officially, and now that we have a corporate member's request concerning this, we need to have something. So I am going to chair that, uh, and I will work with Cush, and we will see what we can do to answer the uh, corporate members. And I think that's all the interim changes that we have made. I'll second the amended. Okay. All right. Uh, <clears throat> yes, Daniel? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. As the uh, staff liaison for the Maintenance and Construction Committee, if I could just get clarification from the board. Um, you had uh, two directors who are already on there, uh, Director Makokokai and Director Gaffron. Are they being replaced by yourself and Director Leonard? No, I'm taking Yvonne Horton's place as chair. And uh, Steve is going to take Egon's place as alternate. Thank you for that clarification. So we should eliminate Egon? Oh, just... We're taking Egon at all? Yes. Okay. For now. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> all in favor of approving the GRF committee appointments as amended? Unanimous. Okay. okay. And now we come down to another fun one. It is my sadness to announce to everybody that our senior GR uh, VMS appointee, Diane Phelps, is resigning for reasons of health uh, as of the VMS meeting tomorrow. Um, therefore, according to the VMS bylaws, we can appoint somebody immediately to take her place, but it has to be done no later than 30 days. So what uh, I worked with Catherine on this, and what we have come up with is that as of today, the nominations will open for people who would like to serve on VMS from GRF, and that's anybody in the village. doesn't matter what, uh, whether you're United, Third, or Mutual 50. Uh, not Mutual 50, excuse me, I guess they, well, guess yeah, they they're GRF. Busy. Sure they are, okay. Um, so uh, this is to serve out her term. She's got another year on her term. Now we will have a second position, Ed Elwell's position on VMS expires in December. So in the regular course of things as uh, go, we will uh, announce, and he may rerun, he may not. I don't know. I haven't talked to him. Uh, but uh, we will have another open uh, selection. This is the only thing that we, as a board, get to do. Our directors are appointed by the <coughs> corporate members. Our bylaws are written by the corporate members. But we get to choose our appointees to the VMS board. Uh, the nominations will close on 1010, which is uh, uh, next Thursday. And this, I'm calling a special meeting for 9.30 a.m. on December, uh, that November. Uh, let's try October. Yes, that's much better. Than <laughs> I've got too many numbers here. October 11th, in other words, a week from Friday. Uh, and at that time, uh, we will select one new member for VMS. What time again? 9.30. Thank you. I'm sorry, it's, we changed it to 10, 10 a.m. 10, okay. Oops. That's easier. <laughs> 10 a.m. is great. 
All right, so anybody out there who is interested in serving on BMS and would like an application can uh, go through our concierge desk here and they will put you in touch with a uh, there. Now, I have to tell you, because there's such a short time in between, if you want to put in a, applica a nomination for VMS, but you don't get this seat, we will keep your application on file for the second seat in December. So you don't have to do that twice. Okay. Um, we wish Diane all the best. She has been absolutely wonderful, both as a board member for GRF on our select audit committee and uh, on her term as SVMS. So we hope all goes, goes well with her. Okay. So that takes care of new business. Committees. And now, because we are under such time constraints with another committee coming in, or another meeting coming in here at 1.30, um, <clears throat> I'm going to do away with the five minute break. Anybody who needs to excuse themselves and go and come back, that's fine, but we're gonna continue with the board reports. Committee reports. Uh, and first will be the Finance Committee, and I thank uh, Donna for stepping in as treasurer. She did a great job in third as treasurer, and uh, so she knows the drill, and she's been willing to step in while uh, William has to be in Korea this month. Okay, thank you. And uh, it is my pleasure to present the Finance Committee report and the Finance Report, but I'd like to start it with what's probably foremost on everybody's mind, and that is next year's per manner per month assessment that is part of GRF, or that GRF is part of your monthly assessment. Let's kind of look at that first. And the word preliminary should be gone from that slide uh, because we have already approved it. We did it last month. But I want to really explain it to you. We've heard a lot of a discussion today about costs and expenses, and, and you saw when we approved our minutes that five sets of minutes were approved for budget meetings that began in March and continued. They were lengthy, and they were after department heads met with finance people, and we met with department heads, and we finally came up with the best we could do was an increase of $9.97 per manor per month as the part of the GRF, the Golden Rain Foundation component of your monthly assessment. And I think what's really important to know is if you look at this slide, that second bold line, 84% of that increase reflects costs over which we had absolutely no control, leaving us with just a fraction under $1.60 a month that was actually raised by GRF to meet some of our needs over which we did have some control. So things that were of greatest concern, utilities. And thankfully, we've created an energy committee today, and I think we well know the importance of that because the biggest part of our utility bill this time and our utility budget for next year has to do with electric and actually gas. Uh, as you hear the, fi the finance report, you'll see that water was a little bit less this year because we had lots of rain. Um, and we placed our budget based upon when we had a lot of rain, and so we actually had, had done a little better. Uh, insurance costs, we have absolutely no control over that, although I must say our insurance person here from, from the village does an amazing job negotiating with insurance companies on all of our behalfs. We outsource lifeguards, which was necessary and workers' comp insurance. So there's absolutely nothing we can do about those things, which left us with a dollar sixty of that increase that we had any control over at all. And so um, hopefully when you see that, when you get your bill, you'll, you'll understand where it came from. And with that, I would like to move on to the report we were expecting, which was the Finance Committee report. This first slide is just all of our revenue, all of our expenses thrown into one basket so you can just see what the big pool is that we work with. 
And assessment revenue obviously came in at budget uh, at a little over $23 million. And our non-assessment revenue came in, as you can see on line number two, just a little bit better than budget. We always like to see that when we can come in better than budget. Um, so when you add those two together, we actually have $35.5 million in revenue. Um, and our expenses were less than our revenue, so that was very good with a surplus, if you would, or at least better than budget in the actuals of $3.2 million. If we put it against everything else, we actually had a variance from budget of $806,000 that was in our favor, and we're very pleased to see that. But let's, let's kind of go on to the next slide. Because this is our operating budget. That was what you saw was the 30,000 foot view. This is the operating budget. This is what we anticipate using, what we expect to have, what we budget for, what we spend lots of time thinking about. And of the total assessment revenue, which we saw on the last slide, $21.5 million of that does go into the operating budget. And of the non-assessment revenue, which is a little over $12 million, $7.4 million. Uh, goes into the, the um, operating budget. And as you can see, the bottom line in the lower right corner, we were $614,000 better than budget on the operating um, statement. So far this year. So far this year, yes, yes. This is this is as of August thirty first. Everything I'm saying is as of August thirty first. So know that. And of course, we don't have September because it just ended yesterday. <laughs> so as we move on to um, the rest of the financial report, this just slide. I always like these graphic slides because you can really see very quickly what happened. And and all this highlights are those things that were significantly better or worse than what we anticipated. And cable programming, our franchise for that was favorable by actually three hundred and twenty nine thousand um, dollars. But the reason for it being that favorable is because it was inadvertently budgeted twice. <laughs> so, so we kind of had a windfall that we weren't expecting. Uh, it is expected that that surplus will last through to the end of the year, and you can be assured that next year there is not a double budgeting for it that has been taken care of. Um, employee compensation, again, this is one of the it's good news, bad news situations. We had $303,000 better than budget in employee compensation, but that's because we still have positions open. And so we need those folks primarily um, in gardening, in landscaping, and in, in some in maintenance, and even in general services. We're constantly looking for people to fill those positions. But So again, better than budget, but not better than getting work done. Um, miscellaneous revenue was favorable due to more clubhouse labor fees in the pack because it got busier. And when it got busier, we got more fees for people doing the work. So that was, was one of the biggest reasons that that was better. And we also had, very exciting to know in an elder community, that our class fee revenue for personal training and group classes was higher than anticipated at the fitness center. So we're all getting out there and using it. Um, clubhouse rental and event fees, again, a little better in, than anticipated because of, of increased bookings. Material and supplies, some of that's savings was because Clubhouse One was closed. And so some of the supplies that would have been used there didn't need to be used. Uh, utilities and telephone, our biggest problem in utilities was really with electric and gas. And so thankfully we've, we've created a committee and we'll really be focusing on that moving forward. Broadband services were unfavorable because the clients who usually do things allocated fewer dollars to cable TV advertising. We did not get the advertising we've had. And as part of that also, our revenue for set-top boxes was lower than anticipated. And part of that is due to the fact that streaming has become much more popular within the community and many of our residents' members are using, are, are, are switching to streaming. So it's something we're, we're definitely aware of and looking at. Um, as we move on to slide number four, five, 
This is just a really nice graphic. You can see that if we look at our non-assessment operating revenue, you can see that most of that revenue does come from broadband services, even though some of our advertising wasn't as good. The golf revenue is almost 20%. And other revenue is really such things as um, fees that we charge, et cetera. And then we have the clubhouse rentals and merchandise sales, a very small part. But that is sort of a nice global picture and a graphic picture of what we have. As we move on to slide number six, just moving right along, our total operating expenses there, our biggest expense is employee compensation and any expenses related to it. And that's probably not a surprise. And then as you move around the graph, you can see cable programming, insurance, outside services, utilities, and that other catch-all category of whatever wasn't shown up above. But again, it's a nice way to really see the big portion of, of um, employee compensation. And if we move on to slide number seven, number, number six, did we skip one? Yeah, I think we did. Go back. Yeah. No. Yeah, the Funny. numbers are off. The numbers are definitely off. You want, you want number seven. I, I know I'm the substitute, but I really did know what was coming up. <laughs> that's, that, that's no fair. <laughs> just, yes, I will definitely say next. And just, again, and, and this is something, you know, look at it at your leisure, um, but it's, it is certainly interesting to see. These are our reserve funds. And we have reserve funds as the broader category, and then restricted fund balances. That's really our contingency fund. And it's important to keep that in mind. That's money that's there in, for those unexpected things, and we have older facilities, et cetera, that tend to have some unexpected things needed. And so as you can see, the ending balance in our equipment fund was $7.1 million. Facilities, $18.5 million. The trust facilities fee fund, that's that money that we get when someone purchases a unit and pays the $7,500. That fund has um, $19.4 million and a total, therefore, in our reserves of a little over $45 million. And our reserves have been looking very good. And one of the biggest parts of those reserves looking good is that we try very not hard not to have not to be putting off maintenance that needs to be done. A lot of home HOAs save money by not doing what needs to get done, and we don't do that. We take care of maintenance as it's needed. So let's move on to the next one. This one is just our, our resale history, and you can see it over the last three years. What's important is there's two things. In the upper right corner, you can see that the average resale price has gone up, which we're all always happy to see. But the number of sales this year is down. And not only, you know, and so we know that's partly with interest rates, et cetera. But what's very important is when we don't have resales, we are not bringing in that $7,500 facilities fee. And so um, it is important to us on the Finance Committee to keep track of those sales so that we also are, are knowing what's happening to that fee. The next slide, and I'm not going to use any numbers since they're off. <laughs> We're going to go to the next one. This is just, um, you're not going to be tested on this in the next five minutes. Um, it's a very complicated chart. It's really just to show you, to give you an idea of the kinds of expenses that we have during the year that we've had to encumber funds for. And it tells you what was encumbered. In the second column, what's remaining to be done. That's work that is in progress but not yet finished. And then under the restricted fund, which remember, that's the contingency fund. Under that one, you only see one thing, which is uh, $47,000, and that was for the West Creek Fuel Modification Project, and that um, is done, as far as I know. There's no encumbrance left for that one. So just to kind of fill you in on the scope of what goes on here at, all the time. And then as we move to the last one, the very last thing that we have is just over the past five years, the, what our reserve fund balances have been and what our contingency fund balances have been. And over the past five years, our reserve fund balances have averaged $33.3 million. And over the past five years, our contingency fund has averaged about $2.75 million. And that concludes the finance report. Any questions?
Thank you. That's it. Thank you, John. Uh, do you have that was the treasurer's report? Do you have a finance committee report? The finance committee report, I have none except that um, we already talked about um, the annual dues and, and the portion. So I put them in a different order. That's fine. Because I think <laughs> it was more important to all of you to hear how and what the, what the new assessment was and how we got there. Okay. So that concludes it. All right, we'll go on to the uh, Community Activities Committee. Uh, Director Vada. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. That was a fabulous report, uh, Donna, very eloquently done. I don't think I'll be able to keep up with that uh, <laughs> enthusiasm. Uh, <clears throat> the last CSE meeting was held on September 12, 2024 at 1.30 p.m. in the boardroom. Uh, several items were discussed. Um, most notable were the 60th uh, anniversary celebration that was held at Clubhouse 2. Uh, there were many attendees, uh, almost 500. Uh, uh, I want to acknowledge that uh, Memorial Care uh, sponsored most of the event and uh, thank them for the wonderful ice cream that they sponsored, which was very welcome on, for that hot day that we had. Uh, the next thing that we discussed was Clubhouse One renovation update, uh, which we did attend a soft opening, not actually a soft opening, but that was an opening for uh, the directors. A uh, lot of, uh, it, it was well done, and uh, we did go around uh, all the rooms, most of the rooms, I would say, and there was a hefty amount of work that needed to be completed by Monday, which was the day of the opening, and uh, the staff did a tremendous job of lifting that stuff off the floor, and well done. Thank you. Um, the the next item that we did was the golf course update. No, that was not. I want to acknowledge that we spoke to Laura Cooley, the supervisor of Clubhouse 3. She spent 35 years uh, working for VMS. And um, uh, very impressive that she's been working still as the supervisor of Clubhouse 3. We also got an update from uh, Tom McRae about the golf course and the driving range. And he keeps a great um, uh, eye on the garden centers and has brought the delinquencies and the um, occupancy of the different uh, plots up to speed, so we have very few uh, empty uh, or vacancies, as I should call it. Uh, our next meeting is going to be on October 10th at 1.30 p.m. in the boardroom. Thank you. Okay, you can continue on, if you would, with the report from the Landscape Committee. Yes. Uh, we did not have a Landscape Committee meeting this last month. So I don't have anything new to report. The last meeting was on August 14, 2024, and our next meeting will be in November, on November 13, 2024, at 2.30 p.m. Uh, there is a slight change, so please note anybody who's planning to attend. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> All right, uh, how about the uh, Water Conservation Committee? Yes. <clears throat> um, there are two exciting things, actually. I should say the first one important, the second one exciting. At its August 8th quarterly community advisory group, El Toro Water District, and by the way, this group, anybody's welcome. You're invited to come. It's quarterly. We had it in August, and so it'll be sometime around November over at El Toro Water District. These are very informative. They also provide lunch. It's just a, a really, really nice event. And at their August 8th event, what was important is they did an engineering report. They were required to look at lead 
in all of the pipes, both the lines coming to every one of their communities and for Laguna Woods, a very big thing, the continuation of those lines to our units. And they needed to be able to say with certainty that there was no lead in the lines. And our community is not a new community, and so there was a little bit of concern, but we are fine. They were able to check it because sections were built in the same way at the same time. They didn't have to check every unit. They could, they could do a section at a time. And everything is fine. We do not have any lead in our lines. So, so that was important, and that's the takeaway from August 8th. But coming up, and um, I do want you to know, and anyone who wants to attend, you can register. On October 17th is the annual H2O for HOAs. And it's put on by all of the water districts in South Orange County. It is a huge event, and um, it's at the, this year it's closer than usual. It's at the Laguna Hills Community Center, which is over on Alicia, and um, it is free of charge. It's from 8 o'clock in the morning till noon. It's quite an event, and the topics of interest to our HOA, and if any of you can go, great, and if you can't, I promise to give a report um, right afterwards at our November meeting uh, because this will be after our October meeting. So um, the topics of interest, water saving strategies for maximizing benefits and controlling costs, something that's important to all of us, how HOAs can protect water quality through efficiency, warm water savings for HOAs, and a legislative update for HOAs. So all of those things, there's a few other topics, but those are of the greatest importance. But one of the things I think you'll all be most interested in is one of the panel members is our own Kurt Weeman who is director of our landscape services. So he will be on the panel that day. And anyone who can go, go to El Toro Water District to register for the free event. And if not, you'll hear about it from me in March, November. Thank you. That's it. Donna, what is the name of the event? The name of the event is H-O H2O for HOAs. H2O for HOAs. Huh? Uh, the date, oh, again, the date, October 17th, 8 o'clock to noon, and not far away over at the Laguna Hills Community Center. Last year I was um, pleased to be on the panel representing the HOAs in South Orange County. And they, it was since we we're one of the bigger customers, I think they decided to take someone from here. And it was a very good event. So I'm looking forward to this one, especially with those topics in particular that would be important to us. That's it. Okay. <clears throat> Next, uh, I have a report on the MNC committee. We met on September 19th, and uh, we talked a lot about the uh, sound system for the PAC theater, which we're going to be taking up in closed meeting today, since it is a contract. Um, Guy West gave us a presentation. We had lots of questions, lots of answers. Uh, we'll see what happens today at the closed meeting. That was the main order of business. And our next meeting is October 9th, next Thursday, Wednesday at 9.30 a.m. here in the boardroom. Um, Oh, I just wanted to make a comment uh, on some of that with the broadband advertising that we had. For I put it in the wrong place here. We should have been under the finance committee. Um, <clears throat> during election years, our advertising usually goes whoof, and we anticipate that it will be. All of our budgets are done a year in advance, almost a year and a half in advance of what my, my things are being done. So um, it's kind of hard without a crystal ball to know exactly what's going to happen. And what happened this year is almost all of our wonderful election advertising went to streaming. That's the way everything is going from the broadband, from the cable to streaming. And we saw it particularly in our advertising revenues for this year. Okay, uh, next we have Media Communications Committee, uh, Director Millinan. Thank you. Uh, our communi meeting communications meeting was last held in July on the 15th. 
And we had a fine presentation about the new website, which is coming up. And uh, that was our main topic last time. And uh, our next meeting will be October 21st at 1.30 here in the boardroom is a virtual meeting, and you definitely want to attend it because there will be much more information on the website, and perhaps we even ha might have it finished very soon. It's, it's, it's coming. It's going to just be a huge explosion, I believe. But anyway, I hope you'll come and see what is happening that day, October 21st. Thank you. Okay, uh, Broadband. Martin? Thank you. Um, the Broadband Ad Hoc Committee uh, had three meetings over this past uh, month, uh, September 11th, 12th, and 16th. It's projected that our next meeting will be probably the week of October 14th is what it's looking at. Uh, not to get into the details of these closed meetings, but I do want to... Um, uh, take a moment to uh, discuss a little bit about uh, the broadband and its current state uh, of what it is in right now. The uh, uh, as we're seeing, we're you know we're going from channelized TV to streaming. Um, but this week, last couple of weeks, broadband's been uh, unfortunately they've been chasing their tails because things have gotten quite noisy. Okay, the um, the hybrid system that was installed 25 years ago of fiber and copper, uh, those coaxial fittings or the braid connects to the, it's just they're oxidizing and uh, broadband's been chasing their tails to find these sources of noise. That just takes down service and in, a, in, in whatever direction. Um, uh, the uh, 25 years ago, like I said, this thing was, was built um, it took about $17 million to put together at that, at that time. Uh, the, uh, I, I, I guess they, they took out a loan of like $10 million to uh, pay for it. Uh, and, but things went well in that they put together quite a, ro a robust that they have, I mean, it's, it's been a workhorse for us and it's been good, but it's, it's time. We are at the point of time where we have to move on to newer technologies. And so that's what we have been studying. Paul uh, Ortiz uh, put out a white paper that, uh, um, uh, and, and, and made presentations to uh, um, the various clubs about the next generation technology, about fiber to the pre premise, and about uh, passive optical networks. And I won't get into all that jargon, but it, it really streamlines uh, what is gonna become available to us and what's really smart, what the, our, our forefathers did, I'll say, <laughs> 25 years ago, they put an extra pathway in the ground uh, for us. And I'm telling you that there's more than half the cost right there in putting in a new system. With having that pathway, what we're, we're coming in with numbers that are going to be uh, very favorable that what we are paying right now for broadband and internet, you're looking at, that's what will be applied to the new system. And get this, you're looking at 20 to 40 times the speed of what you're getting right now. I mean, it's going to be epic, and it's going, but we cannot wait. West Coast uh, internet, that the, the contract's up the end of 26, I believe it is. And so we've got until then to get our new system in place. And I think, I think you're going to be happy with what comes about. There's going to be more publication on this as we move to open. But I think it, I, I'm, I'm very excited about where we're at and where we're going. Thank you. Great. Appreciate that, Martin. Uh, how about a report from M&V, uh, Director Lemmy? Uh, let's see. Uh, according to the paperwork we have, uh, Chair Skillman called the meeting to order. <laughs> Type um, uh, we did not have a meeting this last month. Uh, the meeting was two months ago. Uh, so nothing really to report. Our next scheduled meeting is November 6th at 1.30 p.m. Okay. Moving on 
to Security Community Access Committee. Uh, we met on August 28th, and <clears throat> our next meeting will be October 23rd. Um, and I reported on the August meeting at our September meeting, so I won't go into that since we're pushed for time. Uh, the traffic hearings are held every month, and I stress this is hearings. A lot of people like to call it traffic court. It is not a court. It is a hearing. And nothing is reported to DMV, to the state, to your insurance company. It's all internal to the village. But this is where people can uh, plead their case if they don't think the violation that they were given is correct. Now, I have to tell you, 99% of the time they change their mind when they come in and see that we have videos and pictures of everything. <laughs> so it's, you can't just say, oh, but I stopped, and then you just see a little car going right across the street there. <laughs> so uh, <clears throat> we usually have six or seven uh, cases to hear out at the hearings, and the next one will be this month on uh, September 18th. Um, excuse me, October 16th. Get my months together here. And uh, disaster preparedness, uh, thanks to uh, Siobhan, we know about the main things that we're looking at there. And uh, that's our expo on October 8th and the big shakeout on um, uh, the 14th. So uh, we have another meeting coming up on November 26th. Uh, the good news I can give you from that is that the antennas that have been a big project for two or three years, we bought, we determined we needed them, we bought them, we got them in from afar, and they've been sitting in the warehouse because we could not install them. We thought staff could install, install them, and then when we got them in, we found out that wasn't going to work. So we had to go back through the whole process again and get money supplemental money to install whatever so we can and uh, bid a company, et cetera. But the good news is they are all installed and working. Yay. Okay, how about iTech? Martin? Yes, uh, iTech, uh, we did not meet on September 27th. Uh, and the, the, it was from the previous month. Uh, but we did reschedule September 27th to be on October uh, 25th, and um, and like I say, it is a virtual meeting, and I just want to give a shout out to Chuck Holland and his team. They are doing a terrific job with the ERP rollout. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, and that's our, our committee reports. So let's go on to uh, item 15, which is future agenda items. And I don't think we put anything on 28-day rollout this month for November. Uh, just to remind everybody, GRF does have a November meeting. Uh, Housing Mutuals, especially United, I know doesn't. They just had their annual meetings, but business meetings, we have our business as usual in November because our annual meeting doesn't come up until uh, November, end of November, or second week in November. Anything else that you can think of? Oh, I know. I wanted to put on there, I'd like to task with the new energy task force with a charter uh, for our November meeting, if you will bring us a charter to review. And we can go for there. All righty. Director comments. We usually start this way. I'm going to start this way. Kush? Uh, I don't have any comments, but I just have a question. Okay. Who is on the energy committee? Steve and Donna. Good. And Good Bill Walsh. Good to and know. And they can fill out the committee from there, but we needed at least the, That's the, GRF. the GRF nut to do. Very, very nice committee. Thank you. Okay. No comment. Dan, no comment? Okay. Joan? It's good to be here. No comment. Thank you. <laughs> Martin? Good, a good meeting. Uh, good job, Juanita. Very good. Thank you. Good job. Donna? 
And no comment other than thank you, Anita, for stepping up to the plate and, and having us carry on. So, okay. Other than that, no comment. Egon? And thank you to everybody who's out there who actually stayed. Stayed, until the end. yeah, how about that? <laughs> <laughs> okay, Egon, a comment? No comment? Nothing? Steve? It just occurred to me that I've been negligent in my previous performance. While a director on United, I always made a remark at the end of the meeting about what national day it was. <laughs> There are several today, but I'm going to pick It's National Homemade Cookies Day. Oh, no, no. So no, anyone no, no. who wants to make some homemade cookies, they can put them in my mailbox in the director's lounge. Thank you very much. <laughs> Wonderful meeting. Juanita, thank you, as always. I can add to that. It's also National Taco Day. Yes. <laughs> and all of the taco, big Taco Bell, Del Taco, they're all having special, special, specials on tacos today. I think that right. means it's National Junk Food Day because we're going to have tacos and cookies. <laughs> Lots of good things. Okay. <clears throat> this meeting is recessed uh, to the closed meeting, which we will start at uh, 1 o'clock. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>